Hello again. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Back to part three of Ready Player One. And just a quick recap on yesterday was a very exciting final chapter. Wade Watts, as Parsifal, went into the metaverse and to the IOI headquarters, Innovative Online Industries, to talk to... Um, oh, no. What's his name? Um... Nolan Sorrento, sorry, little brain fart there. And uh, yeah, no spoilers, because I would imagine you've listened to part two in chapter 14. Nolan Sorrento is um, is bribing Parsifal, Wade Watts, to show him how to get the copper key and pass the first gate. Wade won't. And so Nolan Sorrento blows up the stacks where he believes Wade Watts is inside, although Wade isn't, he's in his hideout, but his auntie and her boyfriend and, of course, all the other civilians who live there have all been killed by Nolan Sorrento for the pursuit of, yeah, monetary gain, I would say. So, yeah, another good place to stop. And uh, I mentioned in yesterday's stream that uh, I've underestimated the length of Ready Player One, so we've got um, we've got a few more sessions to go and a few more hours to go. But having you guys here, thanks for coming, Samantha, Julie, and Andrea, welcome. And I believe Julie, you've been um, present at all three, correct? Julie, you can have a magic or a a golden star. <laughs> I'm just joking. And uh, as always, guys. Uh, like the video, subscribe to the channel, maybe share the show on your, uh, oh, not that one, share the show on your social media, and that one is my book club community, where it's the best way you can support me, if you'd like to support me further by being here, subscribing and sharing, that's enough, but if you did want to go that one step further, you can become a, a patron over at the Patreon book club community, but for now... <laughs> Julie, fantastic. I'm glad you're enjoying it. And I'm glad that, yeah, you're looking forward to it because I'm looking forward to it. So that's two of us. It's the rest of them. Right. Anyway, Julie, thank you for being here. And for that, you've perked me right up. So thanks, Julie. And let's go. The His stack has just been blown up. Wade Watts. He's desperate to now contact H and um, Artemis because he's worried about that um, Nolan Sorrento's going to try and get them. Chapter 15. I grabbed my Oasis console and powered it on, then pulled on my visor and gloves. As I logged in, my avatar reappeared on Ludus on the hilltop where I'd been sitting prior to my chat room session with Sorrento. The moment my audio kicked in, I heard the ear-splitting roar of engines coming from somewhere directly overhead. I stepped out from under the tree and looked up. I saw a squadron of Sixer gunships flying in formation, zooming south at low altitude, their sensors scanning the surface as they went. I was about to duck back under the tree, out of sight, when I remembered that all of Ludis was a, P a no PVP zone. The Sixers couldn't the Sixers couldn't harm me here. Even so, my nerves were still on edge. I continued to scan the sky and quickly spotted two more Sixer gunship squadrons off near the eastern horizon. A moment later, several more squadrons dropped in from orbit to the north and west. It looked like an alien invasion. An icon flashed on my display informing me that I had a new text message from H. Where the hell are you? Call me ASAFP. I tapped his name on my contact list and he answered on the first ring. His avatar's face appeared in my vid-feed window. He was wearing a grim expression. Did you hear the news? he asked. What news? The Sixers are on Ludus. Thousands of them, more arriving every minute. They're searching the planet, looking for the tomb. Yeah, I'm on Ludus right now. Sixer gunships everywhere. H scowled. When I find Irock, I'm going to kill him. Slowly. Then when he creates a new avatar, I'm going to hunt him down and kill him again. If that moron had kept his mouth shut, the Sixers never would have thought to look here. Yeah, 
His forum post were what tipped them off. Sorrento said so himself. Sorrento? As in Nolan Sorrento? I told him everything that had happened in the past few hours. They blew up your house? Actually, it was a trailer, I said, in a trailer park. They killed a lot of people here, H. It's probably already on the news feeds. I took a deep breath. I'm freaking out. I'm scared. I don't blame you, he said. Thank God you weren't home when it happened. I nodded. I almost never log in from home. Luckily, the Sixers didn't know that. What about your family? It's my aunt's place. She's dead, I think. We, we weren't very close. This was a huge understatement, of course. My Aunt Alice had never shown me much kindness, but she still hadn't deserved to die. But most of the wrenching guilt I now felt had to do with Mrs. Gilmore and the knowledge that my actions had gotten her killed. She was one of the sweetest people I'd ever known. I realised that I was sobbing. I muted my audio so H couldn't hear, then took several deep breaths until I got myself under control again. I can't believe this, H growled. Those evil pricks, they're going to pay Z. Count on it. We will make them pay for this. I couldn't see how, but I didn't argue. I knew he was just trying to make me feel better. Where are you right now? H asked. Do you need help? Like a place to stay or something? I can wire you some money if you need it. No, I'm okay, I said. But thanks, man. I really appreciate the offer. De nada, amigo. Listen, did the Sixers send you the same email they sent me? Yeah, thousands of them, but I decided it was best to ignore them. I frowned. I wish I'd been smart enough to do that. Dude, you had no way of knowing they were going to try and kill you. Besides, they already had your home address. If you had ignored their emails, they probably would have set off that bomb anyway. Listen, H. Sorrento said that your school records contained a fake home address and that they don't know where to find you. But he might have been lying. You should leave home. Go somewhere safe as soon as possible. Don't worry about me, Z. I stay mobile. Those bastards will never find me. If you say so, I replied, wondering what exactly he meant. But I need to warn Artemis, too, and Daito and Shoto. If I can reach them, the Sixers are probably doing everything they can to learn their identities, too. That gives me an idea, he said. We should invite all three of them to meet us in the basement later tonight, say around midnight, a private chat room session, just the five of us. My mood brightened at the prospect of seeing Artemis again. Do you think they'll all agree to come? Yeah, if we let them know their lives depend on it, he smirked. And we're going to have the world's top five gunters together in one chat room. Who's going to sit that out? I sent Artemis a short message asking her to meet us in H's private chat room at midnight. She replied just a few minutes later, promising to be there. H told me he had managed to reach Daito and Shoto, and they had both also agreed to attend. The meeting was set. I didn't feel like being alone, so I logged into the basement about an hour early. H was already there, surfing the news feeds on the ancient RCA television. Without saying a word, he got up and gave me a hug. Even though I couldn't actually feel it, I found it surprisingly comforting. Then we both sat down and watched the news coverage together while we waited for the others to arrive. Every channel was airing Oasis footage showing the hoarders, the hordes of Sixer spacecraft and troops that were currently arriving on Ludus. It was easy for everyone to guess why they were there, and so now every gunter in the simulation was also headed for Ludus. Transport terminals all over the planet were jammed with incoming avatars. So much for keeping the tomb's location a secret, I said, shaking my head. It was bound to leak out eventually, H said, shutting off the TV. I just didn't think it would happen this fast. We both heard an entrance alert chime as Artemis materialised at the top of the staircase. She was wearing the same outfit she'd had on the night we met. She waved to me as she descended the steps. I waved back, then made introductions. H, meet Artemis. Artemis, this is my best friend, H. Pleasure to meet you, Artemis said, extended her right hand. H shook it. Likewise, he flashed his Cheshire grin. Thanks for coming. Are you kidding? How could I miss it? The very first meeting of the High Five. The High Five, I said. Yeah, H said. That's what they're calling us on all the message boards now. We hold the top High Five high score slots on the scoreboard. So we're the High Five. Right, I said. At least for the time being. Artemis grinned at that, then turned and began to wander around the basement, admiring the 80s decor. H, this is by far the coolest chat room I've ever seen. Thank you, he bowed his head, kind of you to say. She stopped to browse through the shelf of role-playing game supplements. You've created Morrow's 
basement perfectly, every last detail. I want to live here. You've got a permanent spot on the guest list. Log in and hang out any time. Really? She said, clearly delighted. Thank you, I will. You're the man, H. Yes, he said, smiling. It's true. I am. They really seemed to be hitting it off, and it was making me crazy jealous. I didn't want Artemis to like H, or vice versa. I wanted her all to myself. Daito and, Daito and Shoto logged in a moment later, appearing simultaneously at the top of the basement staircase. Daito was the taller of the two and appeared to be in his late teens. Shoto was a foot taller and looked much younger, maybe about thirteen. Both avatars looked Japanese and they bore a striking resemblance to one another, like snapshots of the same young man taken five years apart. They wore matching suits of traditional samurai armour and each had both a short wakizashi and a longer katana strapped to his belt. I'm glad you're enjoying it, Samantha. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. It's good to have you. Welcome. <clears throat> Greetings, the taller samurai said. I am Daito, and this is my little brother, Shoto. Thank you for the invitation. We are honoured to meet all three of you. They bowed in unison. H and Artemis returned the bow, and I quickly followed suit. As we each introduced ourselves, Daito and Shoto bowed to us once again, and once again we each returned the gesture. All right, H said, once all the bowing had ended. Let's get this party started. I'm sure you've all seen the news. The Sixers are swarming all over Ludus, thousands of them. They're conducting a systematic search of the entire surface of the planet. Even if they don't actually know what they're looking for, it won't be long before they find the entrance to the tomb. Actually, Artemis interrupted, they already found it. Over thirty minutes ago, we all turned to look at her. That hasn't been reported on the news feeds yet, Daito said. Are you sure? She nodded. Afraid so. When I heard about the Sixes this morning, I decided to hide an uplink camera in some trees near the tomb entrance to keep an eye on the area. She opened a vid-feed window in the air in front of her and spun it round so the rest of us could see. It showed a wide shot of the flat-topped hill and the clearing around it, looking down from a spot in one of the trees high above. From this angle, it was easy to see that the large black stones on top of the hill were arranged to look like a human skull. We could also see that the entire area was crawling with sixes and more seemed to be arriving every second. But the most disturbing thing we saw on the vid feed was the large transparent dome of energy that now covered the entire hill. Son of a bitch, H said. Is that what I think it is? Artemis nodded. A force field. The Sixers installed it just after the first of them arrived, so so from here on out, Daito said, any gunter who finds the tomb won't be able to get inside, not unless they can somehow get through that force field. Actually, they've put up two force fields, Artemis said, a small field and a larger field over it. They lower them in sequence whenever they want to let more uh, Sixers enter the tomb, like an airlock. She pointed to the window. Watch, they're doing it now. A squadron of sixes marched down the loading ramp of a gunship parked nearby. They were all lugging equipment containers. As they approached the outer force field, it vanished, revealing a smaller domed field inside the first. As soon as the squadron reached the wall of the inner force field, the outer field reappeared. A second later, the inner force field was dropped, allowing the sixes to enter the tomb. There was a long silence while we all contemplated this new development. I suppose it could be worse, H said finally. If the tomb were in a PVP zone, those arseholes would already have laser cannons and robot sentries mounted everywhere to vaporise anyone who approached the area. He was right. Since Ludus was a safe zone, the Sixers couldn't harm Gunters who approached the tomb, but there was nothing to stop them from erecting a force field to keep them out, so that was exactly what they'd done. The Sixers had obviously been planning for this moment for some time now, Artemis said, closing her vid-feed window. They won't be able to keep everyone out for very long, H said. When the clans find out about this, it'll be all-out war. There will be thousands of gunters attacking that force field with everything they've got. RPGs, fireballs, cluster bombs, nukes. It's going to get ugly. They'll, return, they'll turn that force field into a wasteland. Yeah, but in the meantime, six uh, avatars will be farming the copper key and then filling, filing their avatars through the first gate, one after the other, in a freaking conga line. 
But how can they do this? Shoto asked, his young voice brimming with rage. He looked to his brother. It's not fair. They're not playing fair. They don't have to. There are no laws in the oasis, little brother, Daito said. The Sixers can do whatever they please. They won't stop until someone stops them. The Sixers have no honour, Shoto said, scowling. You guys don't know the half of it, H said. That's why Parsifal and I asked you all here. He turned to me. Z, do you want to tell them what happened? I nodded and turned to the others. First, I told them about the email I'd received from IOI. They'd all received the same invitation, but had wisely ignored it. Then I related the details of my chat room session with Sorrento, doing my best not to leave anything out. Finally, I told them how our conversation had ended with a bomb detonating at my home address. By the time I'd finished, their avatars all wore looks of stunned disbelief. Jesus, Artemis whispered, no joke, they tried to kill you. Yeah, they would have succeeded too if I'd been at home. I was just lucky. Now you all know how far the Sixers are willing to go to stop us from beating them to the egg, H said. If they're able to locate any one of us, we're dead meat. I nodded. So you should all take precautions to protect yourselves and your identities, I said, if you haven't already. They all nodded. There was another long silence. There's still one thing I don't understand, Artemis said a moment later. How did the Sixers know to look for the tomb on Ludus? Did someone tip them off? She glanced around at each of us, but there was no hint of accusation in her voice. They must have seen the rumours about Parsifal and H that were posted on all of the Gunter message boards, Shoto said. That's how we knew to look there. Daito winced, then punched his little brother in the shoulder. Didn't I tell you to keep quiet, blabbermouth, he hissed. Shoto looked sheepish and clammed up. What rumours? Artemis asked. She looked at me. What's he talking about? I haven't had time to check the boards in a few days. Several posts were made by Gunters who claimed to know Parsifal and H, saying they were both students on Ludus. He turned to H and me. My brother and I have spent the past two days searching for the Tomb of Horrors. We've scoured dozens of worlds looking for it, but we never thought to look on Ludus, not until we heard that you attended school there. It never occurred to me that attending school on Ludus was something I needed to keep a secret, I said. So I didn't. Yeah, and it's lucky for us that you didn't, H said. He turned to the others. Parsifal unintentionally tipped me off about the tomb's location too. I never thought to look for it on Ludus either, until his name appeared on the scoreboard. Dato nudged his younger brother and they both faced me and bowed. You were the first to find the tomb's hiding place, so we owe you our gratitude for leading us to it. I returned their bow. Thanks, guys. But actually, Artemis found it first, totally on her own, a month before I did. Yeah, for all the good it did me, Artemis said. I couldn't defeat the lich at Joust. I I'd been at it for weeks when this punk showed up and did it on his first try. She explained how we met and how she finally managed to beat the king the following day, right after the server reset at midnight. I have H here to thank for my jousting prowess, I said. We used to play all the time here in the basement. That's the only reason I beat the king on my first attempt. Ditto, H said. He stretched out his hand and we bumped fists. Daito and Shoto both smiled. It was the same with us, Daito said. My brother and I have been playing joust against one another for years because the game was mentioned in Anorak's Almanac. Great, Artemis said, throwing up her hands. Good for you guys. You are all prepared in advance. I'm so happy for you. Bravo. She gave us all a sarcastic golf clap, which made everyone laugh. Now, can we adjourn the Mutual Admiration Society and get back to the topic at hand? Sure, H said smiling. What was the topic at hand? The Sixers, Artemis offered. Oh, right, of course. H grubbed the back of his neck while biting his lower lip. His lower lip. Something he always did when he was trying to gather his thoughts. You said they found the tomb less than an hour ago, right? So any minute now, they'll reach the throne room and face off against the lich. But what do you think happens when multiple avatars enter the burial chamber at the same time? I turned to Daito and Shoto. Your names appeared on the scoreboard on the same day, just a few minutes apart. So you entered the throne room together, didn't you? Daito nodded. Yes, he said. And when we stepped on the dais, two copies of the king appeared, one for each of us to play. Great, Artemis said, so it might be possible for hundreds of sixes to joust for the copper key at the same time, or even thousands. Yeah, Shoto said, but to get the key, each sixer has to beat the lich at joust, which we all know isn't easy. 
The Sixers are using hacked immersion rigs, I said. Sorrento was boasting about it to me. They've got it set up so that different users can control the actions of every one of their avatars, so they can just have their best joust players take control of each Sixer avatar during the match against Acerarak, one after the other. Cheating bastards, H repeated. The Sixers have no honour, Dato said, shaking his head. Yeah, Artemis said, rolling her eyes, we've established that. It gets worse, I said. Every Sixer has a support team made up of Halliday scholars, video game experts and cryptologists who are there to help them beat every challenge and solve every puzzle they encounter. Playing through the war game simulation will be a piece of cake for them. Someone will just feed them the dialogue. We can't, Artemis said. Once they have the copper key, they'll probably locate the first gate just as quickly as we all did. Oh, sorry, no, I missed a bit. Unbelievable, H muttered. How are we supposed to compete with that? We can't, Artemis said. Once they have the copper key, they'll probably locate the first gate just as quickly as we all did. It won't take them very long to catch up with us. And once they have the riddle about the jade key, they'll have their eggheads working round the clock to decipher it. If they find the jade key's hiding place before we do, they'll barricade it too, I said. And then the five of us will be in the same boat everyone else is right now. Artemis nodded. H kicked the coffee table in frustration. This isn't even remotely fair, he said. The Sixers have a huge advantage over all of us. They've got an endless supply of money, weapons, vehicles and avatars. There are thousands of them all working together. Right, I said, and each of us is on our own. Well, except for you two. I nodded at Daito and Shito, or Shoto. But you know what I mean. They've got us outnumbered and outgunned. <laughs> And that isn't going to change any time soon. What are you suggesting? Suggesting, Daito asked. He suddenly sounded uneasy. I'm not suggesting anything, I said. I'm just stating the facts as I see them. Good, Daito replied, because it sounded like you were about to propose some sort of alliance between the five of us. H studied him carefully. So, would that be such a terrible idea? Yes, it would, Daito said curtly. My brother and I hunt alone. We don't want or need your help. Oh, really? H said. A second ago, you were admitting needed Parsifal's help to find the Tomb of Horrors. Daito's eyes narrowed. We would have found it on our own eventually. Right, H said. It probably would have only taken you another five years. Come on, H, I said, stepping between them. This isn't helping. H and Daito glared at each other in silence, while Shoto stared up at his brother uncertainly. Artemis just stu stood back and watched, looking somewhat amused. We didn't come here to be insulted, Daito said finally. We're leaving. Hold on, Daito, I said. Just wait a second, will you? Let's just talk about this. We shouldn't part as enemies. We're all on the same side here. No, Daito said. We're not. You're all strangers to us. For all we know, any one of you could be a six a spy. Artemis laughed out loud at that, then covered her mouth. Daito ignored her. This is pointless, he said. Only one person can be the first to find the egg and win the prize, he said. And that person will be either me or my brother. And with that, Daito and Shoto both abruptly logged out. That went well, Artemis said once their avatars had vanished. I nodded. Yeah, real smooth, H. Way to build bridges. What did I do? He said defensively. Daito was being a complete asshole. Besides, it's not like we're asking him to team up anyway. I'm an avowed solo, and so are you, and Artemis here looks like the lone wolf type too. Guilty as charged, he said, grinning. But even so, there is an argument to be made for forming an alliance against the Sixers. Maybe, H said. But think about it. If you find the Jade Key before either of us do, are you going to be generous to tell us where it is? Artemis smirked. Of course not. Me neither, H said. So there's no point in discussing an alliance. Artemis shrugged. Well, then it looks like the meeting is over. I should probably get going. She winked at me. The clock is ticking, right, boys? Tick tock, I said. Good luck, fellas. She gave us both a wave. See you around. See ya, we both answered in unison. I watched her avatar slowly disappear, then turned to find H smiling at me. What are you grinning about, I asked. You've got a crush on her, don't you? What, on our Artemis? No, don't deny it, Z. You were making googly eyes at her the whole time she was here. He did an impression of this, clasping both his hands to his chest and batting his eyelashes like a silent film star. I recorded the whole chat session. Do you want me to play it back for you so you can see how silly you looked? Stop being a dick. It's understandable, man, H said. That girl is super cute. 
So, have you had any luck with the new riddle, I said, deliberately changing the subject? That quatrain about the jade key? Quatrain? A poem or stanza with four lines and an alternating rhyme scheme, I recited. It's called a quatrain. H rolled his eyes. You're too much, man. <laughs> what? That's the proper name for it, arse head. It's just a riddle, dude. And no, I haven't had any luck figuring it out yet. Me neither, I said. So we probably shouldn't be standing around jabbering at each other. Time to put our noses to the grindstone. I, I concur, he said, but... Just then, a stack of comic books on the other side of the room slid off the table where they were piled up and crashed onto the floor as if something had knocked them over. H and I both jumped, then exchanged confused looks. What the hell was that? I said. I don't know. H walked over and examined the scattered comics. Maybe a software glitch or something. I've never seen a chat room glitch like that, I said, scanning the empty room. Could someone else be in here? An invisible avatar eavesdropping on us? H rolled his eyes. No way, Z, he said. You're getting way too paranoid. This is an encrypted private chat room. No one can enter without my permission. You know that. Right, I said, still freaked out. Relax, it was a glitch. He rested a hand on my shoulder. Listen, let me know if you change your mind about needing a loan or a place to crash, OK? I'll be all right, I said. But thanks, amigo. We bumped fist again, like the Wonder Twins activating their powers. I'll catch you later. Good luck, Z. Same to you, H. Chapter 16 A few hours later, the remaining slots on the scoreboard began to fill up, one after another in rapid succession, not with avatar names, but with IOI employee numbers. Each would appear with a score of 5,000 points which now appeared to be the fixed value for obtaining the copper key. Then the score would jump by another 100,000 points a few hours later, once that sixer had cleared the first gate. By the end of the day, the scoreboard looked like this. Parsifal, Artemis, H, Daito, Shoto, and then all of the IOI employee numbers. I recognised the first sixer employee number to appear because I'd seen it printed on Sorrento's uniform. He probably insisted that his avatar be the first to obtain the copper key and clear the gate. But I had a hard time believing he'd done it on his own. There was no way he was good at joust or that he knew war games by heart. But I now knew that he didn't have to be. When he reached a challenge he couldn't handle, like winning at joust, he could just hand control of his avatar off to one of his underlings. And during the War Games challenge, he'd probably just had someone feeding him all the dialogue via his hacked immersion rig. Once the remaining empty slots were filled, the scoreboard began to grow in length to display rankings beyond 10th place. Before long, 20 avatars were listed on the scoreboard, then 30. Over the next 24 hours, over 60 avatars, or sorry, yeah, over 60 sixer avatars cleared the first gate. Meanwhile, Ludus had become the most popular destination in the Oasis. Transport terminals all over the planet were spitting out a steady stream of gunters who then swarmed across the globe, creating chaos and disrupting classes on every school campus. The Oasis Public School Board saw the writing on the wall and the decision was quickly made to evacuate Ludus and relocate all of its schools to a new location, an identical copy of the planet Ludus II was created in the same sector, a short distance away from the original. All students were given a day off from school while a backup copy of the planet's original source code was copied over to the new site, minus the Tomb of Horrors code Halliday had secretly added to it at some point. Classes resumed on Ludus II the following day, and Ludus was left for the Sixers and Gunters to fight over. News spread quickly that the Sixers were encamped around all the flat-topped hill, around a small flat-topped hill at the centre of a remote forest. The tomb's exact location appeared on the message boards that evening, along with screenshots showing the force field the Sixers had erected to keep everyone else out. The screenshots also clearly showed the, showed the skull pattern on the stones on the hilltop. In a matter of hours, the connection to the Tomb of Horrors D&D module was posted to every single Gunter message board. Then, it hit the news feeds. All of the large Gunter clans immediately banded together to launch a full-scale assault on the Sixers' force field, trying everything they could think of to bring it down or circumvent it. 
The Sixers had installed teleportation disruptors, which prevented anyone from transporting inside the force field via technological means. They had also stationed a team of high-level wizards around the tomb. These magic users cast spells around the clocks, around the clock, keeping the entire area encased in a temporary null magic zone. This prevented the force field from being bypassed by any magical means. The clans began to bombard the outer force field with rockets, missiles, nukes and harsh language. They laid siege to the tomb all night, but the following morning both force fields remained intact. In desperation, the clans decided to break out the heavy artillery. They pulled their resources and purchased two very expensive, very powerful, powerful antimatter bombs on eBay. They detonated both of them in sequence just a few seconds apart. The first bomb took down the outer shield and the second bomb finished the job. The moment the second force field went down, thousands of gunters, all unarmed by the bomb blast due to their the no PVP zone, swarmed into the tomb and clogged the corridors of the dungeon below. Soon thousands of gunters and sixers had crammed into the burial chamber, all ready to challenge the Lich King to a game of joust. Multiple copies of the king appeared, one for every avatar who set foot on the dais. Ninety-five percent of the gunters who challenged him lost and were then killed, but a few gunters were successful, and at the bottom of the scoreboard list, after the high five and the dozens of IOI employee numbers, new avatar names began to appear. Within a few days, the list of avatars on the scoreboard was over a hundred names long. Now that the area was full of gunters, it became impossible for the Sixers to put their force field back in operation. Gunters were mobbing them and destroying their ships and equipment on site, so the Sixers gave up on their barricade, but they continued to send avatars into the Tomb of Horrors to farm copies of the Copper Key. No one could do anything to stop them. The day after the explosion in the stacks, there was a brief story about it in one of the local news feeds. They showed a video clip of volunteers sifting through the wreckage for human remains. What they did find couldn't be identified. It seemed that the Sixers had also planted a large amount of drug manufacturing equipment and chemicals at the scene to make it look like a meth lab in one of the trailers had exploded. It worked like a charm. The cops didn't bother to investigate any further. The stacks were so dense around the pile of crushed and charred trailers that it was too dangerous to try to clear them out with one of the old construction cranes. They just left the wreckage where it was to slowly rust into the, into the earth. As soon as the first endorsement payment arrived in my account, I bought a one-way bus ticket to Columbus, Ohio, set to depart at eight in the following morning. I paid extra for a first-class seat, which came with a comfier chair and a high bandwidth uplink jack. I planned to spend most of the long ride east, logged into the oasis. Once my trip was booked, I inventoried everything in my hideout and packed the items I wanted to take with me in an old rucksack. My school issued Oasis console, visor and gloves, my dog-eared printout of Anorak's almanac, my grail diary, some clothes, my laptop, everything else I left behind. When it got dark, I climbed out of the van, locked it, and hurled the keys off into the junk pile. Then I hoisted the rucksack and walked out of the stacks for the last time. I didn't look back. I kept to busy streets and managed to avoid getting mugged on the way to the bus terminal. A battered customer service kiosk, kiosk stood just inside the door, and after a quick retinal scan, it spat out my ticket. I sat by the gate, reading my copy of the almanac, until it was time to board the bus. It was a double-decker with armour plating, bulletproof windows and solar panels on the roof. A rolling fortress. I had a window seat, two rows behind the driver who was encased in bulletproof plexiglass box. A team of six heavily armed guards rode on the bus's upper deck to protect the vehicle and its passengers in the event of a hijacking by road agents or scavengers. A distinct possibility once we ventured out into the lawless badlands that now existed outside the safety of the large cities. Every single seat on the bus was occupied. Most of the passengers put on their visors the moment they sat down. I left mine off a while. I left mine off a while, though, long enough to watch the city of my birth recede from view on the road behind us as we rolled through the sea of wind turbines that surrounded it. 
the bus's electric motor had a top speed of about 40 miles an hour. But due to the deteriorating interstate highway system and the countless stops the bus had to make at charging stations along the way, it took several days for me to reach my destination. I spent nearly all of that time logged into the Oasis, preparing to start my new life. The first order of business was to create a new identity. This wasn't that difficult now that I had some money. In the Oasis, you could buy almost any kind of information if you knew where to look and who to ask, and if you didn't mind breaking the law. There were plenty of desperate and corrupt people working for the government and for every major corporation, and these people often sold information on the Oasis black market. My new status as a world-famous gunter gave me all kinds of underworld credibility, which helped me get access to highly exclusive illegal data auction site known as the Leet Hacksaw's Wares House. And for a shockingly small amount of money, I was able to purchase a series of access procedures and passwords for the USCR, United States Citizen Registry Database. Using these, I was able to log into the database and access my existing citizen profile, which had been created when I enrolled for school. I deleted my fingerprints and retinal patterns, then replaced them with those of someone deceased, my father. Then I copied my own fingerprints and retinal patterns into a completely new identity profile that I'd created under the name of Bryce Lynch. I made Bryce 22 years old and gave him a brand new social security number, an immaculate credit rating and a bachelor's degree in computer science. When I wanted to become my old self again, all I had to do was to delete the Lynch identity and copy my prints and retinal patterns back over to my original file. Once my new identity was set up, I began searching the Columbus Classifieds for a suitable apartment and found a relatively inexpensive room in an old high-rise hotel, a relic from the days when people physically travelled for business and pleasure. Interesting thing there, hey? With the pandemic and people starting zoom in, zoom in. The rooms had all been converted into one-room efficiency apartments and each unit had been modified to meet the very specific needs of a full-time gunter. It had everything I wanted, low rent, a high-end security system and steady, reliable access to as much electricity as I could afford. Most important, it offered a direct fibre-optic connection to the main Oasis server vault which was located just a few miles away. This was the fastest and most secure type of internet connection available, and since it wasn't provided by IOI or one of its subsidiaries, I wouldn't have to be paranoid about them monitoring my connection or trying to trace my location. I would be safe. I spoke with a rental agent in a chat room and he showed me around a virtual mock-up of my new digs. The place looked perfect. I rented the room under my new name and paid six months' rent up front. That kept the agent from asking any questions. Sometimes during the late hours of the night, as the bus slowly hummed along the crumbling highway, I removed my visor and stared out the window. I'd never been outside of Oklahoma City before, and I was curious to see what the rest of the country looked like. But the view was perpetually bleak, and each decaying, overcrowded city we rolled through looked just like the last. Finally, after it felt like we'd been crawling along the highway for months, the Columbus skyline appeared on the horizon, glittering like Oz at the end of the yellow brick road. We arrived around sunset and already there were more electric lights burning in the city than I'd ever seen at any time. I'd read that, all, I'd, I'd read that giant solar arrays were positioned throughout the city along with two heliostat power plants on the outskirts. They drank in the sun's power all day, stored it, and fed it back out each night. As we pulled into the Columbus bus terminal, my Oasis connection cut out. I pulled off my visor and filed off the bus with the other passengers, the reality of my situation finally beginning to hit home. I was now a fugitive, living under an assumed name. Powerful people were out looking for me, people who wanted me dead. As I stepped off the bus, I suddenly felt as though a heavy weight were resting on my chest. I was having a hard time breathing. Maybe I was having a panic attack. I forced myself to take deep breaths and try to calm down. All I had to do was to get to my new apartment, set up my rig and log back into the Oasis. Then everything would be all right. I'd be back in familiar surroundings. I would be safe. 
I hailed an autocab and entered my new address on the touch screen. The synthesized voice of the cab's computer told me the drive would take an estimated 32 minutes with the current traffic conditions. During the ride, I stared out the window at the dark city streets. I still felt light-headed and anxious. I kept glancing at the meter to see how much farther we had to go. Finally, the cab pulled up in front of my new apartment building, a slate-grey monolith on the banks of the city of the Seoto, just at the edge of the Twin Rivers ghetto. I noticed a discoloured outline on the building's facade, where the Hilton logo used to be back when the place had been a hotel. I thumbed my fare and climbed out of the cab. Then I took one last look around, inhaled one final breath of fresh air, and carried my bag through the front door and into the lobby. When I stepped inside the security checkpoint cage, my fingers, prints and retinal patterns were scanned and my new name flashed on the monitor. A green light lit up and the cage door slid open, allowing me to continue to the elevator. Elevators. My apartment was on the second floor, number 4211. The security lock mounted outside required another retinal scan. Then the door slid open and the internal interior light switched on. There was no furniture in the cube-shaped room and only one window. I stepped inside, closed the door and locked it behind me. Then I made a silent vow not to go outside again until I completed my quest. I would abandon the real world altogether until I found the egg. Hello there, Chef Key. Chef Key the poet. And what, what is Saki? Tell me what Saki is. Uh, you've mentioned it a few times, but I've never heard of it. Tell us what Saki is. <clears throat> and now, I don't know if you can see that. We're on level two. Level two, it says, I'm not crazy about reality, but it's still the only place to get a decent meal. And that's Groucho Marx. Chapter 17, <clears throat> and here we have sort of a, a text, a, a quite a long text conversation, very long in fact, a very long text conversation from Artemis and Parsifal, so I'm not going to say, hello there TJ Francis, chapter 17, we've just started level 2, um, Okay, I'll, I'll look into it, Chef Key, because we like um, short stories here at Book Club, so, although we ain't been reading many recently with the long stories. So, chapter 17, it's a, a text um, a text dialogue, and I'm not going to keep saying Parsifal Artemis, Parsifal Artemis, but it begins with Artemis, and she says, Are you there? Yes, hey. I can't believe you finally responded to one of my chat requests. Only to ask you to cut it out. It's a bad idea for us to start chatting. Why, I thought we were friends. You seem like a great guy, but we're competitors, rival gunters, swarm enemies. You know the drill. We don't have to talk about anything related to the hunt. Everything is related to the hunt. Come on, at least give it a shot. Let's start over. Hi, Artemis. How have you been? Fine. Thanks for asking. You? Outstanding. Listen, why are we using this ancient only chat interface? I can host a virtual chat room for us. I prefer this. Why? As you may recall, I tend to ramble in real time. When I have to type out everything I want to say, I come off as less of a flibber, a flibber tigibit. I don't think you're a flibber tigibit. You're enchanting. Did you just use the word enchanting? What I typed is right there in front of you, isn't it? That's very sweet, but you're full of crap. I'm totally and completely serious. So, how's life at the top of the scoreboard, hotshot? Sick of being famous yet? I don't feel famous. Are you kidding? The whole world is dying to find out who you really are. You're a rock star, man. You're just as famous as I am. And if I'm such a rock star, how come the media always portrays me as some unwashed geek who never goes outside? I take it you saw that SNL skit they did about us. Yeah, why does everyone assume I'm an antisocial nut job? You're not antisocial. No, maybe, okay, yes, but I have excellent personal hygiene. At least they got your gender correct. Everyone thinks I'm a man in real life. That's because most gunters are male, and they can't accept the idea that a woman has beaten and or outsmarted them. I know, Neanderthals. 
So you're telling me definitively that you are a female, IRL. You should have already figured that out on your own, colossal. I did. I have. Have you? Yes, after analysing the available data I've conducted that you must be a female. Why must I? Because I don't want to find out that I've got a crush on some 300 pound dude named Chuck who lives in his mother's basement in suburban Detroit. You've got a crush on me? You should have already figured that out on your own. Cluso, sorry. Cluso, Colosso, Cluso. What if I were a 300 pound gal named Charlene who lives in her mother's basement in suburban Detroit? Would you still have a crush on me then? I don't know. Do you live in your mother's basement? No. Uh, yeah, then I probably still would. So I'm supposed to believe you're one of those mythical guys who only cares about a woman's personality and not about the package it comes in? Why is it that you assume I'm a man? Please, it's obvious. I get nothing but boy vibes coming from you. Boy vibes? What? Do I use masculine sentence structure or something? Don't change the subject. You were saying that you have a crush on me. I've had a crush on you since even before we met, from reading your blog and watching your POV. I've been cyber-stalking you for years. But you still don't really know anything about me, or my real personality. This is the oasis. We exist as nothing but raw personality in here. I beg to differ. Everything about our online personas is filtered through our avatars, which allows us to control how we look and sound to others. The oasis lets you be whoever you want to be. That's why everyone is addicted to it. So, IRL, you must be nothing. You're nothing like the person that I met in the tomb. That was just one side of me, the side I chose to show you. Well, I like that side. And if you showed me your other sides, I'm sure I'd like those too. You say that now, but I know how these things work. Sooner or later, you'll demand to see a picture of the real me. I'm not the sort who makes demands. Besides, I'm definitely not going to show you a photo of me. Why? Are you but ugly? You're such a hypocrite. So answer the question, Claire, are you ugly? I must be. Why? The females of the species has always found me repellent. I don't find you repellent. Of course not. That's because you're an obese man named Chuck who likes to chat up ugly young boys online. So you're a young man, relatively young, relatively to what? To a 53-year-old guy like you, Chuck. Does your mum let you live in that basement rent-free or what? Is that really what you're picturing? If it were, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't be chatting with you right now. So what do you imagine I look like then? Like your avatar, I suppose, except, you know, without the armour, guns or glowing sword. You're kidding, right? That's the first th rule of online romances, pal. No one ever looks anything like their avatar. Are we going to have an online romance? Cross his fingers. No way, eh? Sorry. Why not? No time for love, Dr. Jones. My cyber porn addiction eats up most of my free time. And searching for the jade key takes up the rest. That's what I should be doing right now, in fact. Yeah, so should I. But talking to you is more fun. How about you? How about me what? Do you have time for an online romance? I've got time for you. You're too much. I'm not even laying it on thick yet. Do you have a job or are you still in high school? High school, I graduate next week. You shouldn't reveal stuff like that. I could be a Sixer spy trying to profile you. The Sixers already profiled me, remember? They blew up my house. Well, it was a trailer, but they blew it up. I know, I'm still freaked out about that. I can only imagine how you feel. Revenge is a dish best served cold. Bon appetit. What do you do when you're not hunting? I refuse to answer any more questions until you start reciprocating. Fine. Quid pro quo, Dr. Lecter. We'll take turns asking questions. Go ahead. Do you work or go to school? College. Studying what? It's my turn. What do you do when you're not hunting? Nothing. Hunting is all I do. I'm hunting right now, in fact. Multitasking all over the goddamn place. Same here. Really? I'll keep an eye on the school board then, just in case. You do that, Ace. What are you studying in college? Poetry and creative writing. That makes sense. You're a fantastic writer. Thanks for the compliment. How old are you? Just turned 18 last month. You? Don't you think we're getting a little too personal now? Not even remotely. 19. Ah, an older woman, hot. That is, if I am a woman. Are you a woman? It's not your turn. Fine. How well do you know H? He's been my best friend for five years. Now spill it. Are you a woman? And by that I mean, are you a, fee a human female who has never had a sex change operation? That's pretty specific. Answer the question, Claire. I am and always have been a human female. 
Have you ever met H I R L? Oh, in real life? No. Do you have any siblings? No. You? Nope. You got parents? They died, the flu. So I was raised by my grandparents. You got parentage? No, mine are dead too. Kinda sucks, doesn't it? Not having your parents around. Yeah, but a lot of people are worse off than me. I tell myself that all the time. So, are you and H working as a duo? Oh, here we go. Well, are you? No. He asked me the same thing about you and me, you know, because you cleared the first gate a few hours after I did. Which reminds me, why did you give me that tip about changing signs on the jazz game? I felt like helping you. Well, you shouldn't make that mistake again because I'm the one who's going to win. You do realise that, right? Yeah, yeah, we'll see. You're not holding up your end of the Q&A, goof. You're like five questions behind. Fine. What colour is your hair in real life? Brunette. Eyes? Blue. Just like your avatar, eh? Do you have the same face and body too, as far as you know? OK, what's your favourite movie of all time? It changes. Right now, probably Highlander. You've got great taste, lady. I know I have. I know. I have a thing for evil, bald guys. The Kurgan is too sexy. I'm going to shave my head right now and start wearing leather. Send photos. Listen, I've got to go in a few minutes, Romeo. You can ask me one last question, then I need to get some sleep. When can we chat again? After one of us finds the egg. That could take years. So be it. Can I at least keep emailing you? Not a good idea. You can't stop me from emailing you. Actually, I can. I can block you on my contact list. You wouldn't do that, though, would you? Not if you not if you don't force me to. Harsh. Unnecessarily harsh. Good night, Parsible. Farewell, Artemis. Sweet dreams. Chat log ends. Tw- 2nd February 27, 2045, 0251, Oasis Standard Time. So that was a little... Um, a little chat between the two romantics. Uh, Chef, I'm going to check it out because you're clearly a um, a um, a talented poet. And if Saki has inspired you, then he must be, uh, like you say, a very good writer. So, <clears throat> I will be sure to check it out. I started emailing her. At first, I showed restraint and only wrote her once a week. To my, t- to my surprise, she never failed to respond. Usually it was with, with just a single sentence, saying she was too busy to reply, but her replies eventually got longer and we began to correspond. A few times a week at first, then, as our emails grew longer and more personal, we started writing each other at least once a day, sometimes more. Whenever an email from her arrived in my inbox, I dropped everything to read it. Before long, we were meeting in private chat room sessions at least once a day. We played vintage board games, watched movies and listened to music. We talked for hours, long rambling conversations about everything under the sun. Spending time with her was intoxicating. We seemed to have everything in common. We shared the same interests. We were driven by the same goal. She got all of my jokes. She made me laugh. She made me think. She changed the way I saw the world. I'd never had such a powerful, immediate connection with another human being before, not even with H. I no longer cared that we were supposed to be rivals, and she didn't seem to either. We began to share details about our research. We told each other what movies we were currently watching and what books we were reading. We even began to exchange theories and to discuss our interpretations of specific passages in the Almanac. I couldn't make myself be cautious around her. A little voice in my head kept trying to tell me that every word she said could be disinformation and that she might just be playing me for a fool, but I didn't believe it. I trusted her, even though I had every reason not to. I graduated from high school in early June. I didn't attend the graduation ceremony. I'd stopped attending classes altogether when I fled the stacks. As far as I knew, the Sixers thought I was dead and I didn't want to tip them off by showing up for my last few weeks of school. Missing finals week wasn't a big deal since I already had more than enough credits to receive my diploma. The school emailed a copy of it to me. They snail mailed the actual diploma to my address in the stacks, which was no longer existed, so I don't know what became of it. When I finished school, I intended to devote all of my time to the hunt, but all I really wanted to do was spend time with Artemis. (laughs) 
When I wasn't hanging out with my new online pseudo-girlfriend, I devoted the rest of my time to levelling up my avatar. Gunters called this making the climb to 99, because 99th level was the maximum power level an avatar could attain. Artemis and H had both recently done it, and I felt compelled to catch up. It actually didn't take me very long. I now had nothing but free time, and I had the money and the means to fully explore the oasis. So I began to compete every quest I could complete every quest I could find, sometimes jumping five or six levels in one day. I became a split class warrior mage. As my stats continued to increase, I honed my avatar's combat and spell casting abilities while collecting a wide array of powerful weapons, magic items, and vehicles. Artemis and I even teamed up for a few quests. We visited the planet Gon Goondocks and finished the entire Goonies quest in just one day. Artie played through it as Martha Plimpton's character, Steph, while I played as Mikey, Sean Astin's character. It was entirely too much fun. I didn't spend all of my time goofing off. I tried to keep my head in the game. Really, I did. At least once a day, I would pull up the quatrain and try once again to decipher its meaning. The captain conceals the jade key in a dwelling long neglected, but if you can only blow the whistle, but you can only blow the whistle once the trophies are all collected. For a while I thought that the whistle in the third line might be a reference to the late 60s Japanese TV show called The Space Giants, which had been dubbed in English and rebroadcast in the United States in the 70s and 80s. The Space Giants, called Maguma Taishi in Japan, featured a family of transforming robots who lived in a volcano and battled an evil alien villain named Rodak. Halliday referred to this show several times in Anorak's Almanac, citing it as one of his childhood favourites. One of the show's main characters was a boy named Maiko, or Miko, who would blow a special whistle to summon the robots to his aid. I watched all 52 ultra-cheesy episodes of the Space Giants back-to-back -back while wolfing down corn chips and taking notes. But when the viewing marathon was over, I still wasn't any closer to understanding the quatrain's meaning. I'd hit another dead end. I decided that Halliday must be referring to some other whistle. Then, one Saturday morning, I finally made a small breakthrough. I was watching a collection of vintage 80s cereal commercials when I paused to wonder why cereal manufacturers no longer included toy prizes inside every box. It was a tragedy, in my opinion, another sign that civilization was going straight down the tubes. I was still pondering this when an old Captain Crunch commercial came on, and that was when I made a connection between the first and third lines of the quatrain. The captain conceals the jade key, but you can only blow the whistle. Halliday was a... Yes, I've, I've already got uh, O. Henry, Chef Key, so I have a collection of O. Henry, so maybe Saki's next then. Halliday was alluding to a famous 70s hacker named John Draper, better known by the alias Captain Crunch. Draper was one of the first phone freaks, and he was famous for discovering that the toy plastic whistles found as prizes in boxes of Captain Crunch cereal could be used to make free long-distance phone calls because they emitted a 2600 hertz tone that tricked the old analog phone system into giving you free access to the line. The Captain the captain conceals the jade key. That had to be it. The captain was Captain Crunch, and the whistle was the famous toy plastic whistle of phone freak lore. Maybe the jade key was disguised as one of those toy plastic whistles, and it was hidden in a box of Captain Crunch cereal. But where was that cereal box hidden? In a dwelling long neglected. I still didn't know what long neglected dwelling that line referred to, or where to look for it. I visited every neglected dwelling I could think of, recreations of the Adams family house, the abandoned shack in the Evil Dead trilogy, Tyler Durden's flop house in Fight Club, and the Lars homestead in Ta Tatooine. No luck finding the jade key inside any of them. Dead end after dead end. But you can only blow the whistle once the trophies are all collected. I still hadn't deciphered the meaning of that last line either. What trophies did I have to collect, or what was some, or, or was that some kind of half-assed metaphor?
There had to be a simple connection I wasn't making, a sly reference that I still wasn't clever or knowledgeable enough to catch. Since then, I'd failed to make any more progress. Every time I revisited the quatrain, my ongoing infatuation with Artemis would undermine my ability to focus, and before long, I would close my grail diary and call her up to see if she wanted to hang out. She almost always did. I convinced myself that it was all right to slack off a bit, because no one else seemed to be making any progress in their search for the Jade Key. The scoreboard remained unchanged. Everyone else seemed to be just as stumped as I was. As the weeks continued to pass, Artemis and I spent more and more time together. Even when our avatars were doing other things, we were sending emails and instant messages to each other. A river of words flowed between us. I wanted more than anything to meet her in the real world, face to face, but I didn't tell her this. I was certain she had strong feelings for me, but she also kept me at a distance. No matter how much I revealed about myself to her, and I wound up revealing just about everything, including my real name, she always adamantly refused to reveal any details about her own life. All I knew was that she was 19 and that she lived somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. That was all she would tell me. The image of her that formed in my mind was the most obvious one. I pictured her as a physical manifestation of her avatar. I imagined her with the same face, eyes, hair and body, even though she told me repeatedly that in reality she looked almost nothing like her avatar and that she wasn't nearly as attractive in person. When I began to spend most of my time with Artemis, H and I began to grow apart. Instead of hanging out several times a week, we chatted a few times a month. H knew I was falling for Artemis, but he never gave me too much grief about it, even when I would bail on him at the last minute to hang out with her instead. He would just shrug, tell me to be careful and say, I sure hope you know what you're doing, Z. I didn't, of course. My whole relationship with Artemis was in defiance of all common sense, but I couldn't help falling for her. Somehow, without my realising it, my obsession with finding Halliday's Easter egg was gradually being supplanted by my obsession with Artemis. Eventually, she and I began to go out on dates, taking day trips to exotic oasis locales and exclusive night spots. At first, Artemis protested. She thought I should keep a low profile because as soon as my avatar was spotted in public, the Sixers would know that their attempt to kill me had failed and I'd be back on their hit list. But I told her I no longer cared. I was already hiding from the Sixers in the real world and I refused to continue hiding from them in the Oasis too. Besides, I had a 99th level avatar now. I felt nigh invincible. Maybe I was just trying to impress Artemis by acting fearless. If so, I think it worked. We still disguised our avatars before we went out because we knew there would be tabloid headlines galore if Parsifal and Artemis started showing up in public together on a regular basis. But there was one exception. One night, she took me to see the Rocky Horror Picture Show in a huge stadium-sized movie theatre on the planet Transsexual, where they held the most highly attended and longest-running weekly screaming of the movie in the Oasis. Thousands of avatars came to every show to sit in the stands and revel in the audience participation. Normally, only long-standing members of the Rocky Horror Fan Club were permitted to get on stage and help act out the film in front of the giant movie screen, and only after they'd passed the gruelling audition process. But Artemis used her fame to pull a few strings, and she and I were both allowed to join the cast for that night's show. The whole planet was in a no-PVP zone, so I wasn't worried about getting ambushed by the Sixers, but I did have a serious case of stage fright when the show began. Artemis played a note-perfect Columbia, and I had the honour of playing her undead love interest, Eddie. I altered my avatar's appearance so that I looked exactly like Meatloaf did in the role, but my performance and lip-syncing still kind of sucked. Luckily, the audience cut me a lot of slack, because I was the famous gunter, Parsifal, and I was clearly having a blast. That night was easily the most fun I'd ever had in my life up to that point. I told Artemis so afterwards, and that was when she leaned over and kissed me for the first time. I couldn't feel it, of course, but it still set my heart racing. I'd heard all the clichéd warning about the perils of falling for someone you only knew online, but I ignored them. 
I decided that whoever Artemis really was, I was in love with her. I could feel it, deep in the soft, chewy caramel centre of my being. And then one night, like a complete idiot, I told her how I felt. <clears throat> Getting interesting, guys. The storyline's heating up, so. <clears throat> Is that an eight <clears throat> or a nine? I think it's 18, isn't it? Chapter 18. It was Friday night and I was spending another solitary evening doing research, working my way through every episode of WizKids, an early 80s TV show about a teenage hacker who uses his computer skills to solve mysteries. I'd just finished watching the episode Deadly Access, a crossover with Simon and Simon, when an email arrived in my inbox. It was from Ogden Morrow. The subject line read, We can dance if we want to. There was no text in the body of the email, just a file attachment an invitation to one of the most exclusive gatherings in the Oasis, Ogden Morrow's birthday party. In the real world, Morrow almost never made public appearances, and in the Oasis he came out of hiding only once a year to host this event. The invitation featured a photo of Morrow's world-famous avatar, the great and powerful Og, the grey-bearded wizard was hunched over an elaborate DJ mixing board, one headphone pressed to his ear, biting his lower lip in auditory ecstasy as his fingers scratched ancient vinyl on a set of silver turntables. His record crate bore a Don't Panic sticker and an anti-sixer logo, a yellow number six with a red circle and a slash over it. The text at the bottom read, Ogden Morrow's 80s dance party in celebration of his 73rd birthday tonight, 10pm Oasis Stand and Time at the Distracted Globe. Admit one. I was flabbergasted. Ogden Morrow had actually taken the time to invite me to his birthday party. It felt like the greatest honour I'd ever received. I called Artemis and she confirmed that she had received the same email. She said she couldn't pass up an invitation from Og himself, despite the obvious risks, so naturally I told her I would meet her there at the club. It was the only way I could avoid looking like a total wuss. I knew that if Og had invited the two of us, he'd probably also invited the other members of the High Five, but H probably wouldn't show up because he, complete, he competed in a globally televised arena deathmatch every Friday night and Shoto and Daito never entered a PvP zone unless it was absolutely necessary. The Distracted Globe was a famous zero-gravity dance club on the planet Neonoir Neo -Noir in Sector 16. Ogden Morrow had coded the place himself decades ago and was still its sole owner. I'd never visited the Globe before. I wasn't much for dancing or for socialising with the twinked-out wannabe gunter uber-dorks who were known to frequent the place. But Og's birthday party was a special event, and so the usual clientele would be banished for the evening. Tonight, the club would be packed with celebrities, movie stars, musicians, and at least two members of the High Five. I spent over an hour tweaking my avatar's hair and trying on different skins to wear to the club. I finally settled on some classic 80s-era attire, a light grey suit exactly like the one Peter Weller wore in Buckaroo Banzai, complete with a red bow tie along with a pair of vintage white Adidas high tops. I also loaded my inventory with my best suit of body armour and a large amount of weaponry. One of the reasons the Globe was such a hip, exclusive club was because it was located in a player v player zone, one where both magic and technology functioned, so it was extremely dangerous to go there, especially for a famous gunter like me. There were hundreds of cyberpunk theme worlds spread throughout the oasis, but Neo Noir was one of the largest and oldest. Seen from orbit, it was a plan the planet was a shiny onyx marble covered in overlapping spider webs of pulsating light. It was always night on Neo Noir, the world over, and its surface was an uninterrupted grid of inter interconnected cities packed with impossibly large skyscrapers. 
Its skies were filled with a continuous stream of flying vehicles whirring through the vertical cityscapes, and the streets below teemed with leather-clad NPCs and mirror-shaded avatars all sporting high-tech weaponry and subcutaneous implants as they spouted city-speak straight out of Neuromancer. The distracted globe was located at the western hemisphere intersection of the boulevard and the avenue, two brightly lit streets that stretch completely around the planet along its equator and prime meridian. The club itself was a massive cobalt blue sphere three kilometres in diameter floating 30 metres off the ground. A floating crystal staircase led up to the club's only entrance, a circular opening at the bottom of the sphere. I made a big in entrance when I arrived in my flying DeLorean, which I'd obtained by completing a Back to the Future quest on the planet Zemeki, Zemeckis. The DeLorean came outfitted with a non-function flux capacitor, but I'd made several additions to its equipment and appearance. First, I'd installed an artificially intelligent on-ball computer named Kit, purchased in an online auction into the dashboard along with a matching red Knight Rider scanner just above the DeLorean's grille. Then I'd outfitted the car with an oscillation overthruster, a device that allowed it to travel through solid matter. Finally, to complete my 80s super vehicle theme, I'd slapped a Ghostbusters logo on each of the DeLorean gullwing doors, then added personalised plates that read Ecto-88. I'd had it only a few weeks, but now, but by, sorry, I'd had it only a few weeks now, but my time-travelling, ghost-busting, night-riding, matter-penetrating DeLorean had already become my avatar's trademark. I knew that leaving my sweet ride parked in a PvP zone was an open invitation for some moron to try to boost it. The DeLorean had several anti-theft systems installed, and the ignition system was booby-trapped, Max Rockantes Max Rockatansky style so that if any, if any other avatar tried to start the car, the plutonium chamber would detonate in a small thermonuclear explosion. But keeping my, set, my car safe wouldn't be a problem here on Neo Noir. As soon as I climbed out of the DeLorean, I cast a shrink spell on it, instantly reducing it to the size of a matchbox car. Then I put the DeLorean in my pocket. Magic zones had their advantages. Thousands of avatars were packed up against the velvet rope force fields that kept everyone without an invitation at bay. As I walked towards the entrance, the crowd bombarded me with a mix of insults, autograph requests, death threats and tearful declarations of undying love. I had my body shield activated, but surprisingly, no one took a shot at me. I flashed the cyborg doorman my invitation, then mounted the long crystal staircase leading up into the club. Entering the distracted globe was more than a little disorientating, or disorienting. The inside of the giant sphere was completely hollow, and its curved interior surface served as the club's bar and lounge area. The moment you passed through the entrance, the law of gravity changed. No matter where you walked, your avatar's feet always adhered to the interior of the sphere, so you could walk in a straight line up to the top of the club and then back down the other side, ending right back where you started. The huge open space in the centre of the sphere served as the club's zero-gravity dance floor. You reached it simply by jumping off the ground, like Superman taking flight, and then swimming through the air into the spherical zero-g groove zone. As I stepped through the entrance, I glanced up, or in the direction that was currently up to me at the moment, and took a long look round. The place was packed. Hundreds of avatars milled around like ants crawling around the inside of a giant balloon. Others were already out on the dance floor spinning, flying, twisting and tumbling in time with the music which thumped out of floating spherical speakers that drifted throughout the club. In the middle of all the dancers a large clear bubble was suspended in space at the absolute centre of the club. This was the booth where the DJ stood, surrounded by turntables, mixers, decks and dials. At the centre of all that was the opening DJ R2-D2, hard at work, using his various robotic arms to work the turntables. I recognised the tune he was playing 
the 88 remix of the New Order's Blue Monday, with a lot of Star Wars droid sound samples mixed in. As I made my way to the nearest bar, the avatars I passed all stopped to stare and point in my direction. I didn't pay them much notice because I was busy scanning the club for Artemis. When I reached the bar, I ordered a pan-galactic gargle blaster from the female Klingon bartender and downed half of it. Then I grinned as R2 queued up another classic 80s tune, Union of the Snake. I recited mostly out of habit, Duran Duran. 1983. Not bad, Ace, said a familiar voice, speaking just loud enough to be heard over the music. I turned to see Artemis standing behind me. She was wearing evening attire, a gunmetal blue dress that looked like it was spray-painted on. Her avatar's dark hair was styled in a page-boy cut, perfectly framing her gorgeous face. She looked devastating. She shouted at the barkeep, Glen Morangi. On the rocks, I spiled to myself, Connor McLeod's favourite drink. Man, did I love this girl. She winked at me as her drink appeared. Then she clinked her glass against mine and downed its contents in one swallow. The chattering of the avatars around us grew in volume. Word that Parsifal and Artemis were here, chatting each other up at the bar was already spreading through the entire club. Artemis glanced up at the dance floor, then back at me. So how about it, Percy, she said. Feel like cutting a rug? I scowled. Not if you keep calling me Percy. She laughed. Just then the current song ended and the club grew silent. All eyes turned upwards towards the DJ booth where R2-D2 was currently dissolving in a shower of light, like someone beaming out in an original Star Trek episode. Then a huge cheer went up as a familiar grey-haired avatar beamed in, appearing behind the turntables. It was Og. Hundreds of vid-feed windows materialised in the air all over the club. Each displayed a live close-up image of Og in the booth so that everyone could see his avatar clearly. The old wizard was wearing baggy jeans, sandals and a faded Star Trek The Next Generation t-shirt. He waved to the assembled, then queued up his first track, a dance remake of Rebel Yell by Billy Idol. A cheer swept across the dance floor. I love this song, Artemis shouted. Her eyes darted up to the dance floor. I looked at her uncertain, uncertainly. What's wrong, she said, with mock sympathy. Can't the boy dance? She locked into the beat, bobbing her head, gyrating her hips. Then she pushed off from the floor with both feet and began to float upward, drifting towards the groove zone. I stared up at her, temporarily frozen, mustering my, com my courage. All right, I muttered to myself. What the hell? I bent my knees and pushed off hard from the floor. My avatar took flight, drifting upward and sliding alongside Artemis. The avatars, who were already on the dance floor, moved aside to clear a path for us, a tunnel leading to the centre of the dance floor. I could see Og hovering in his bubble, just at the short distance above us. He was spinning around like a dervish, remixing the song on the fly while simultaneously adjusting the gravity vortex of the dance floor so that he was actually spinning the club itself like an ancient vinyl disc. Artemis winked at me and then her legs melted together to form a mermaid's tail. She flapped her new tail fin once and shot ahead of me, her body undulating and thrusting in time with the machine gun beat as she swam through the air. Then she span back around to face me, suspended and floating, smiling and holding out her hand, beckoning me to join her. Her hair floated in a halo round her head, like she was underwater. Excuse me. When I reached her, she took my hand. As she did, her mermaid tail vanished and her legs reappeared, whirling and scissoring to the beat. Not trusting my instincts any further, I loaded up a piece of high-end avatar dance software called Travoltra, <laughs> which I'd downloaded and tested earlier that evening. The program took control of Parsifal's movements, syncing them up with the music, and all four of my limbs were transported into undulating cosine waves. Just like that, I became a dancing fool. Artemis's eyes lit up in surprise and delight, and she began to mirror my movements, the two of us orbiting each other like accelerated electrons. Then Artemis began shape-shifting. 
Her avatar lost its human form and dissolved into a pulsing, amorphous blob that changed its size and colour in sync with the music. I selected the mirror partner option on my dance software and began to do the same. My avatar's limbs and torso began to flow and spin like taffy and circling Artemis, while strange colour patterns flowed and shifted across my skin. I looked like Plastic Man if he were tripping out of his mind on LSD. Then everyone else on the dance floor also began to shapeshift, melting into prismatic blobs of light. Soon the centre of the club looked like some otherworldly lava lamp. When the song ended, Og took a bow, then queued up a slow song, Time After Time, by Cindy Lauper. All around us, avatars began to pair up. I gave Artemis a curtly bow and stretched out my hand. She smiled and took it. I pulled her close and we began to drift together. Og set the dance floor's gravity on a counterclockwise spin, making all of our avatars slowly rotate around the club's invisible central axis, like motes of dust inside, floating inside a snow globe. And then, before I, and then, before I could stop myself, the words just came out. I'm in love with you, Artie. She didn't seem to respond at first. She just looked at me in shock as our avatars continued to drift in orbit around each other, moving on autopilot. Then she switched to a private voice channel so no one could eavesdrop on our conversation. You aren't in love with me, Z, she said. You don't even know me. Yes, I do, I insisted. I know you better than I've ever known anyone in my entire life. You only know what I want you to know. You only know what I want you to see. She placed a hand on her chest. This isn't my real body, Wade, or my real face. I don't care. I'm in love with your mind, with the person you are. I couldn't care less about the packaging. You're just saying that, she said. There was an unsteadiness in her voice. Trust me, if I ever let you see me in person, you would be repulsed. Why do you always say that? Because I'm hideously deformed, or I'm a paraplegic, or I'm actually 63 years old. Take your pick. I don't care if you're all of those three things. Tell me where to meet you and I'll prove it. I'll get on a plane right now and fly to wherever you are. You know I will. She shook her head. You don't live in the real world, Z. From what you've told me, I don't think you ever have. You're like me. You live inside this illusion. She motioned to our virtual surroundings. You can't possibly know what real love is. Don't say that. I was starting to cry and didn't bother hiding it from her. Is it because I told you I've never had a real girlfriend and that I'm a virgin? Because, of course not, she said. That isn't what this is about, at all. Then what is it about? Tell me, please. The hunt, you know that. We've both been neglecting our quest to hang out with each other. We should be focused on finding the Jade Key right now. You can bet that's what Sorrento and the Sixers are doing, and everyone else. To hell with our competition, and the egg, I shouted. Didn't you hear what I just said? I'm in love with you, and I want to be with you, more than anything. She just stared at me, or rather, her avatar stared blankly back at my avatar. Then she said, I'm sorry, Z, this is all my fault. I let this get away out of hand. It has to stop. What do you mean it has to stop? I think we should take a break, stop spending so much time together. I felt like I'd been punched in the throat. Are you breaking up with me? Nosy, she said firmly. I am not breaking up with you. That would be impossible because we are not together. There was suddenly venom in her voice. We've never even met. So then you're just going to stop talking to me? Yes, I think that would be for the best. For how long? Until the hunt is over. But Artie, that could take years. I realise that and I'm sorry, but this is how it has to be. So winning that money is more important to you than me? It's not about the money, it's about what I could do with it. Right, saving the world, you're so effing noble. Don't be a jerk, she said. I've been searching for the egg for over five years. So have you. Now we're closer than ever to finding it. I can't just throw my chance away. I'm not asking you to. Yes, you are, even if you don't realise it. The Cindy Lauper song ended and Og queued up another dance trap. James Brown is Dead by L.A. Style. The club erupted in applause. I felt like a large wooden stake had been driven into my chest. Artemis was about to say something more, goodbye I think, when we heard a thunderous boom directly above us. At first I thought it was Og train wrecking into a new dance track. 
but then I looked up and saw the large chunks of rubble tumbling at high speed onto the dance floor as Avatar scattered to get out of the way. A gaping hole had just been blasted in the roof of the club near the top of the globe, and a small army of sixes was now pouring through it, swooping into the club on jetpacks, firing blaster pistols as they came. Total chaos broke out. Half of the avatars in the club swarmed towards the exit, while the other half drew weapons or began to cast spells, firing laser bolts, bullets and fireballs back at the invading sixes. There were more than a hundred of them, all armed to the teeth. I couldn't believe the Sixes' bravado. Why would, they, why would they be dumb enough to attack a room full of high-level gunters on their own turf? They might kill a few of us. <sighs> Excuse me. <laughs> they might kill a few of us, but they were going to lose, or all of their own avatars in the process, and for what? Then I realised that most of the Sixes' incoming fire seemed to be directed at me and Artemis. They were here to kill the two of us. The news that Artemis and I were here must have already hit the news feeds, and when Sorrento had learnt that the two top gunters on the scoreboard were hanging out in an unshielded PvP zone, he must have decided that it was too juicy a target to pass up. This was the Sixes' dance to... T or sorry, chance, to take out their two biggest competitors in one shot. It was worth wasting a hundred or so of their highest level avatars. I knew my own recklessness had brought them down on us. I cursed myself for being so foolish. Then I drew my blasters and began to unload them at the cluster of sixes nearest to me while also doing my best to dodge their incoming fire. I glanced over at Artemis just in time to see her incinerate a dozen sixes in the space of five seconds, using balls of blue plasma that she hurled out of her palms. While ignoring the steady stream of laser bolts and magic missiles ricocheting off her transparent body shield, I was taking heavy fire too. So far, my body shield was holding up, but it wasn't going to last much longer. Failure warnings were already flashing on my display and my hit point counter was starting to plummet. Hey King Arjun, how you doing? Nice to see you. In seconds the situation escalated into the largest confrontation I'd ever witnessed and it already seemed clear that Artemis and I were going to be on the losing side. I noticed that the music still hadn't stopped. I glanced up at the DJ booth just in time to see it crack open as the great and powerful Og emerged from within. He looked really, really annoyed. You jerks think you can just crash my birthday party, he shouted, his avatar still wearing a mic, so his words blasted over the club's speaker array, reverberating like the voice of God. The melee seemed to halt for a split second as all eyes turned to look at Og, who was now floating in the centre of the dance floor. He stretched out his arms as he turned to face the onslaught of sixes. A dozen tines of red lightning erupted from each of Og's fingertips, branching out in all directions. Each tine struck a different sixer avatar in the chest, while somehow arching, arcing harmlessly around everyone else. In a millisecond, every single sixer in the club was completely vaporised. Their avatars froze and glowed bright red for a few seconds, then simply vanished. I was awestruck. It was the most incredible display of power by an avatar I'd ever seen. Nobody busts into my joint, uninvited, Og shouted, his voice echoing through the now silent club. The remaining avatars, the ones who hadn't fled the club in terror or been killed in the brief battle, let out a victorious cheer. Og flew back into the DJ booth, which closed up around him like a transparent cocoon. Let's get this party going again, shall we? he said, dropping the needle on a techno remix of Atomic by Blondie. It took a moment for the shock to wear off, but then everyone started to dance again. I looked around for Artemis, but she seemed to have vanished. Then I spotted her avatar flying out of the new exit the Sixer attack had created. She stopped and hovered outside a moment, just long enough to glance back at me.
Chapter 19. My computer woke me up just before sundown and I began my daily ritual. I'm up, I shouted at the darkness. In the week since Artemis had dumped me, I'd had a hard time getting out of bed in the morning, so I'd disabled my alarm snooze feature and instructed the computer to blast Wake Me Up Before You Go Go by Wham. I loathed that song with every fibre of my being, and getting up was the only way to silence it. It was the most pleasant way to start it wasn't the most pleasant way to start my day, but it got me moving. The song cut off and my haptic chair reshaped and reoriented itself, transforming from a bed back into its chair configuration, lifting me into a sitting position as it did so. The computer began to bring up the light slowly, allow my eyes to adjust. No outside light ever penetrated my apartment. The single window had once provided a view of the Columbus skyline, but I'd spray-painted it completely black a few days after I moved in. I decided that everything outside the window was a distraction from my quest, so I didn't need to waste time staring at it. I didn't want to hear the outside world either, but I hadn't been able to improve upon the apartment's existing soundproofing, so I had to live with the muffled sounds of wind and rain and of street and air traffic. Even these could be a distraction. At times I'd slip into a kind of trance, sitting with my eyes closed, oblivious to the passage of time, listening to the sounds of the world outside my room. I'd made several other modifications to the apartment for the sake of security and convenience. First I replaced the flimsy door with a new airtight, armour-plated, vacuum-sealed war door. <laughs> Serious. <laughs> Whenever I needed something, food, toilet paper, new gear, I ordered it online and someone brought it right to my door. Deliveries worked like this. First, the scanner mounted outside in the hallway would verify the delivery person's identity and my computer would confirm they were delivering something I'd actually ordered. <clears throat> then the outer door would unlock itself and slide open, revealing a steel reinforced airlock about the size of a shower stall. The delivery person would place the parcel, pizza, or whatever inside the airlock and step back. The outer door would hiss shut and relock itself. Then the package would be scanned, x-rayed, and analysed eight ways from Wednesday. <clears throat> its contents would be verified and delivered, confirma and delivery confirmation would be sent. Then I would unlock and open the inner door and receive my goods. Capitalism would inch forward without my actually having to interact face to face with another human being, which was exactly how I preferred it. Thank you. The room itself wasn't much to look at, which was fine, because I spent as little time looking at it as possible. It was basically a cube about ten metres long on each side. A modular shower and toilet unit were embedded in one wall opposite the small ergonomic kitchen. I never actually used the kitchen to cook anything. My, my meals were all frozen or delivered. Microwave brownies were as close as I ever got to cooking. The rest of the room was dominated by my Oasis immersion rig. I'd invested every spare cent I had in it. Newer, faster or more versatile components were always being released, so I was constantly spending large chunks of my meagre income on upgrades. The crown jewel in my rig was, of course, my customised Oasis console, the computer that powered my world. I'd built it myself piece by piece inside a modded mirror black Odinware sphere chassis. It had a new overclocked processor that was so fast its cycle time bordered on precognition, and the internal hard drive had enough storage space to hold three digitised copies of everything in existence. I spent the majority of my time inside my Shaptic Technologies HC5000 fully adjustable haptic chair. It was suspended by two jointed robotic arms anchored to my apartment's walls and ceiling. These arms could rotate the chair on all four axes, so when I was strapped into it, the unit could fl flip, spin or shake my body to create the sensation that I was falling, flying, falling, flying, or sitting behind the wheel of a nuclear-powered rocket sled hurtling at Mach 
two through a canyon on the fourth moon of Altair Six. <clears throat> The chair worked in conjunction with my shaptic boot suit, a full body haptic feedback suit. It covered every inch of my body from the neck down and had discrete openings so I could relieve myself without removing the entire thing. The outside of the suit was covered with an elaborate exoskeleton, a network of artificial tendons and joints that could both sense and inhibit my movements. Built into the inside of the suit was a web-like network of miniature actuators that made contact with my skin every few centimetres. These could be activated in small or large groups for the purpose of tactile simulation to make my skin feel things that weren't really there. They could convincingly simulate the sensation of a tap on the shoulder or a kick to the shin or a gunshot in the chest. Building safety software prevented my rig from actually causing me any physical harm, so a simulated gunshot actually felt more like a weak punch. I had an identical backup suit hanging in the mosh wash cleaning unit in the corner of my room. These two hapstick suits made up my entire wardrobe. My old street clothes were bur buried somewhere in the closet, collecting dust. On my hands, I wore a pair of state-of-the-art Okagami Idle Hands haptic data gloves. Special tactile feedback pads covered both palms, allowing the gloves to create the illusion that I was touching objects and surfaces that didn't actually exist. My visor was a brand new pair of Dynatro RLR 7 T800 Rec Specs featuring a top-of-the-line virtual retinal display. The visor drew the Oasis directly onto my retinas at the highest frame weight and resolution perceptible to the human eye. The real world looked washed out and blurry by comparison. The RLR 7800 was not yet available to the ple plebeian masses prototype, but I had an endorsement deal with Dynatro, so they sent me free gear, shipped to me through a series of remailing services, which I used to maintain my anonymity. My abound sound audio system consisted of, of an array of ultra-thin ultra thin speakers mounted on the apartment's walls, floor and ceiling, providing 360 degrees of perfect spatial pin-drop sound reproduction. And the Molnur subwoofer was powerful enough to make my back teeth vibrate. The Olfatrix smell tower in the corner was capable of generating over 2,000 discernible odours, a rose garden, salty ocean wind, burning cordite. The tower could convincingly recreate them all. It also sounded as, as an industrial strength, or oh sorry, it also doubled as an industrial strength air conditioner purifier, which was primarily what I used it for. A lot of jokers like to code really horrific smells into their simulations just to mess with people who own smell towers, so I usually left the odour generator disabled unless I was in a part of the oasis where I thought being able to smell my surroundings might prove useful. On the floor directly underneath my suspended haptic chair was my Okagami runaround omnidirectional treadmill. No matter where you go, there you are, was the manufacturer's slogan. The treadmill was about two metres square and six centimetres thick. When it was activated, I could run at top speed in any direction and never reach the edge of the platform. If I changed direction, the treadmill would sense it and its rolling surface would change direction to match me, always keeping my body near the centre of the platform. This model was also equipped with built-in lifts and an amorphous surface so that it could simulate walking up inclines and staircases. You could also purchase an ACHD, anatomically correct haptic doll, if you wanted to have more intimate encounters inside the Oasis. ACHDs came in male, female and dual sex models and were available with a wide array of options. Realistic latex skin, servo motor driven endoskeletons, simulated musculature and all of the attendant appendages and orifices one would imagine. 
Driven by loneliness, curiosity and raging teen hormones, I'd purchased a mid-range ACHD, the shaptic uber beauty a few weeks after Artemis stopped speaking to me. After spending several highly unproductive days inside a standalone brothel simulation called the Pleasure Dome, I'd gotten rid of the doll out of a combination of shame and self-preservation. I'd wasted thousands of credits, missed a whole week of work, and was on the verge of completely abandoning my quest for the egg when I confronted the grim realisation that virtual sex, no matter how realistic, was really nothing but glorified, computer-assisted masturbation. At the end of the day, I was still a virgin, all alone in a dark room, humping a lubed-up robot. So I got rid of the ACHD and went back to spanking the monkey the old-fashioned way. I felt no shame about masturbating. Thanks to Anorak's almanac, I now f thought of it as a normal bodily function, as necessary and natural as sleeping or eating. Anorak's almanac, 241.87 I would argue that masturbation is the human animal's most important adaptation, the very cornerstone of our technological civilization. Our hands evolved to grip tools, all right, including our own. You see, thinkers, inventors and scientists are usually geeks, and geeks have a harder time getting laid than anyone. Without the built-in sexual release valve provided by masturbation, it's doubtful that early humans would have ever mastered the secrets of fire or discovered the wheel. And you can bet that Galileo, Newton and Einstein never would have made their discoveries if they hadn't first been able to clear their heads by slapping the salami or knocking a few protons off the old hydrogen atom. The same goes for Mary Curie, but she discovered radium. You can be certain she first discovered the little man in the canoe. <laughs> Sorry about that. It wasn't one of Halliday's more popular theories, but I liked it. As I shuffled over to the toilet, a large flat-screen monitor mounted on the wall switched on, and the smiling face of Max, my system agent software, appeared on the screen. I'd program Max to start up a few minutes after I turned on the lights, so I could wake up a little before he started jabbering to me. G -g Good morning, Wade, Max stuttered cheerily. Rise and to shine. Running the system agent software was a little like having a virtual personal assistant, one that also functioned as a voice-activated interface with your computer. System agent software was highly configurable, with hundreds of pre-programmed personalities to choose from. I'd programmed mine to look, sound and behave like Max Headroom, the ostensibly computer-generated star of the late 80s talk show, a groundbreaking cyber cyberpunk TV series and a slew of Coke commercials. Good morning, Max, I replied groggily. I think you mean good evening, Rumpelstiltskin. It's 7.18pm, Oasis t -t Standard Time, Wednesday, December 30th. Max was programmed to speak with a slight electronic stutter. In the mid-80s, when the character of Max Headroom was created, computers weren't actually powerful enough to generate a photorealistic human figure. So Max had been portrayed by an actor, the brilliant Matt Frewer, who wore a lot of rubber makeup to make him look computer generated. But the version of Max now smiling at me on the monitor was pure software, with the best simulated AI and voice recognition subroutines money could buy. I'd been running a highly customized version of Max Headroom version 3.4.1 for a few weeks now. Before that, my system agent software had been modded, modelled after the actress Erin Gray of Buck Rogers and Silver Spoon's fame. <clears throat> but she had proved to be way too, too distracting, so I'd switched to Max. He was annoying at times, but he also cracked me up. He did a pretty decent job of keeping me from feeling lonesome too. As I stumbled into the bathroom module and emptied my bladder, Max continued to address me from a small monitor mounted above the mirror. Uh-oh, it appears you've sp sp sprung a leak, he said. Get a new joke, I said. Any news I should know about? Just the usual, wars, rioting, famine, nothing that would interest you. Any messages? He rolled his eyes. A few, but to answer your real question, no. 
Artemis still hasn't called or written you back, lover boy. I've warned you, don't call me that, Max. You're begging to be deleted. Touchy, touchy. Honestly, Wade, when did you get so s s sensitive? I'll erase you, Max, I mean it. Keep it up and I'll switch back to Wilma Deering, or I'll try out the disembodied voice of Magil Barrett. Max made a pouty face and spun around to face the shifting digital wallpaper behind him, currently a pattern of multicoloured vector lines. Max was always like this, giving me grief was part of his pre-programmed personality. I actually sort of enjoyed it, because it reminded me of hanging out with H, I, and I really missed hanging out with H a lot. My gaze dropped to the bathroom mirror, but I didn't much like what I saw there, so I closed my eyes until I finished urinating. I wondered, not for the first time, why I hadn't painted the mirror black too, when I'd done the window. The hour or so after I woke up was my least favourite part of the day, because I spent it in the real world. This was when I dealt with the tedious business of cleaning and exercising my physical body. I hated this part of the day because everything about it contradicted my other life. My real life inside the oasis. The sight of my tiny one-room apartment, my immersion rig or my reflection in the mirror, they all served as a harsh reminder that the world I spent my days in was not, in fact, the real one. Retract chair. I said as I stepped out of the bathroom. The haptic chair instantly flattened itself again, then retracted so that it was flush against the wall, clearing a large empty space in the centre of the room. I pulled on my visor and loaded up the gym, a standalone simulation. Now I was standing in a large modern fitness centre, lined with exercise equipment and weight machines, all of which could be perfectly simulated by my haptic suit. I began my daily workout, sit-ups, stomach crunches, push-ups, aerobics, weight training. Occasionally, Max would shout words of encouragement. Get those legs up, you s -s sissy. Feel the burn. I usually got a little exercise while logged into the Oasis by engaging in physical combat or running around the virtual landscape on my treadmill but I spent the vast majority of my time sitting in my haptic chair, getting almost no exercise at all. I also had a habit of overeating when I was depressed or frustrated, which was most of the time. As a result, I'd gradually started to put on some extra pounds. I wasn't in the best shape to begin with, so I quickly reached a point where I could no longer fit comfortably in my haptic chair or squeeze into my XL haptic suit. Soon I would need to buy a new rig, with components from the husky line. I knew that if I didn't get my weight under control, I would probably die of sloth before I found the egg. I couldn't let that happen, so I made a snap decision and enabled the voluntary Oasis Fitness Lockout software on my rig. I'd regretted it almost immediately. From then on, my computer monitored my vital signals and kept track of exactly how many calories I burned during the course of each day. If I didn't meet my daily exercise requirements, the system prevented me from logging in to my Oasis account. This meant that I couldn't go to work, continue my quest or, in effect, live my life. Once the lockout was engaged, you couldn't disable it for two months and the software was bound to my Oasis account, so I couldn't just buy a new computer or go rent a booth in some public Oasis cafe. If I wanted to log in, I had no choice but to exercise first. This proved to be the only motivation I needed. The lockout software also monitored my dietary intake. Each day I was allowed to select meals from a preset menu of healthy, low-calorie foods. The software would order the food for me online and it would be delivered to my door. Since I never left my apartment, it was easy for the program to keep track of everything I ate. If I ordered additional food on my own, it would increase the amount of exercise I had to do each day to offset my additional calorie intake. This was some sadistic software. But it worked. The pounds began to melt off, and after a few months, I was in near-perfect health. For the first time in my life, I had a flat stomach and muscles. I also had twice the energy, and I got sick a lot less frequently. When the two months ended and I was finally given the option to disable the fitness lockout, I decided to keep it in place. Now exercising was part of my daily ritual. Once I finished with my weight training, I stepped onto the treadmill. Begin morning run, I said to Max. 
Bifrost track. The virtual gym vanished, now was standing on a semi-transparent running track, a curved looping ribbon suspended in a starry nebula. Giant ringed planets and multicoloured moons were suspended in space all around me. The running track stretched out ahead of me, rising, falling and occasionally spiring into a helix. An invisible barrier prevented me from accidentally running off the edge of the track and plummeting into the starry abyss. The Bifrost track was another standalone simulation, one of several hundred tracks, desi track design stored on my console's hard drive. As I began to run, Max fired up my 80s music playlist. As the first song began, I quickly rattled off its title, artist, album and year of release from memory. A million miles away, the plimpsoles, everywhere at once, 1983. Then I began to sing along, reciting the lyrics. Having the right 80s song lyrics memorised might save my avatar's life someday. When I finished my run, I pulled off my visor and began removing my haptic suit. This had to be done slowly to prevent damaging the suit's components. As I carefully peeled it off, the contact patches made tiny popping sounds as they pulled free of my skin, leaving tiny circular marks all over my body. Once I had the suit off, I placed it inside the cleaning unit and laid my clean spare suit out on the floor. Max had already turned on the shower for me, setting the water temperature right where I liked it. As I jumped into the steam-filled stall, Max switched the music over to my shower tunes playlist. I recognised the opening riffs of Chains by John Waite from the Vision Quest soundtrack, Geffen Records, 1985. The shower worked a lot like an old car wash. I just stood there while it, while it did most of the work, blasting me from all angles with soapy, with soapy water, then rinsing me off. I had no hair to wash because the shower also dispensed a non-toxic hair-removing solution that I rubbed all over my face and body. This eliminated the need for me to shave or cut my hair, both hassles I didn't need. Having smooth skin also helped make sure my haptic suit fit snugly. I looked a little freaky without any eyebrows, but I got used to it. When the rinse jets cut off, the blow dries kicked on, blasting the moisture off my skin in a matter of seconds. I stepped into the kitchen and took out a can of sludge, a high-protein vitamin D-infused breakfast drink, to help counteract my sunlight deprivation. As I gulped it down, my computer sensors silently took note, scanning the barcode and adding the calories to my total for the day. With breakfast out of the way, I pulled on my clean haptic suit. This was less tricky than taking the suit off, but it still took time to do properly. Once I had the suit on, I ordered the haptic chair to extend. Then I paused and spent a moment staring at my immersion rig. I've been so proud of all this high-tech adventure, or sorry, all this high-tech hardware when I'd first purchased it. But over the past few months, I'd come to see my rig for what it was, an elaborate contraption for deceiving my senses, to allow me to live in a world that didn't exist. Each component of my rig was a bar in the cell where I'd willingly imprisoned myself. Standing there under the bleak fluorescence of my tiny one-room apartment, there was no escaping the truth. In real life, I was nothing but an antisocial hermit, a recluse, a pale-skinned pop culture obsessed geek, an agoraphobic shut-in with no real friends, family or genuine human contact. I was just another sad, lost, lonely soul wasting his life on a glorified video game. But not in the Oasis. In there I was the great Parzival, world-famous gunter and international celebrity. People asked for my autograph. I had a fan club, several actually. I was recognised everywhere I went, but only when I wanted to be. I was paid to endorse products. People admired and looked up to me. I got invited to the most exclusive parties. <laughs> I went to all the hippest clubs and never had to wait in line. I was a pop culture icon, a VR rock star, and in Gunter Circles, I was a legend, nay, a god. I sat down and pulled on my gloves and visor. 
Once my identity was verified, the Gregarious Simulation Systems logo appeared in front of me, followed by the login prompt. Greetings, passable. Please speak your passphrase. I cleared my throat and recited my passphrase. Each word appeared on my display as I said it. No one in the world ever gets what they want, and that is beautiful. There was a brief pause, and then I let out an involuntary sigh of relief as the oasis faded into existence all around me. Chapter 20 my avatar slowly materialised in front of the control panel in my stronghold's command centre, the same spot where I'd been sitting the night before, engaged in my evening ritual of staring blankly at the quatrain until I drifted off to sleep and the system logged me out. I'd been staring at the damn thing for almost six months now, and I still hadn't been able to decipher it. No one had. Everyone had theories, of course, but the Jade Key still remained unfound and top rankings on the scoreboard remained static. My command centre was located under an armoured drone embedded in the rocky surface of my own private asteroid. From here, I, I had a sweeping 360-degree view of the surrounding cratered landscape stretching to the horizon in all directions. The rest of my stronghold was below ground in a vast subterranean complex that stretched all the way to the asteroid's core. I'd coded the entire thing myself shortly after moving to Columbus. My avatar needed a stronghold and I didn't want any neighbours, so I'd bought the cheapest planetoid I could find, this tiny barren asteroid in Sector 14. Its designation was S14A316, but I'd renamed it Falco after the Austri Austrian rap star. I wasn't a huge Falco fan or anything, I just thought it sounded like a cool name. Falco had only a few square kilometres of surface area, but it still cost me a pretty penny. It had been worth it, though. When you owned your own world, you could build whatever you wanted there, and no one could visit it unless I granted them access, something I never gave to anyone. My stronghold was my home inside the oasis, my avatar's sanctuary. It was the only place in the entire simulation where I was truly safe. As soon as my login sequence completed, a window popped up on my display, informing me that today was an election day. Now that I was 18, I could vote in both the Oasis elections and the elections for the US government officials. I didn't bother with the latter, because I didn't see the point. The once great country into which I'd been born now resembled its former self in name only. It didn't matter who was in charge, those people were rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, and everyone knew it. Besides, now that everyone could vote from home via the Oasis, the only people who could get elected were movie stars, reality TV personalities, or radical televangelists. <clears throat> I did take the time to vote in the Oasis elections, however, because their outcomes actually affected me. The voting process only took me a few minutes because I was already familiar with all of the major issues GSS had put on the ballot. It was also time to elect the president and VP of the Oasis User Council, but that was, no, that was a no-brainer. Like most Gunters, I voted to re-elect Corey Doctorow and Will Wheaton again. There were no term limits, and these two geezers had been doing a kick-ass job of protecting user rights for over a decade. When I finished voting, I adjusted my haptic chair slightly and studied the command console in front of me. It was crammed with switches, buttons, keyboards, joysticks and display screens. A bank of security monitors on my left were linked to virtual cameras placed throughout the interior and exterior of my stronghold. To my right, another bank of monitors displayed all my favourite news and entertainment vid feeds. Among these was my own channel, Parsival TV, broadcasting obscure, eclectic crap, 24-7, 365. Earlier that year, GSS had added a new feature to every Oasis user's account, the POV, 
personal Oasis vid feed channel. It allowed anyone who paid a monthly fee to run their own streaming television network. Anyone logged into the simulation could tune in and watch your POV channel from anywhere in the world. What you aired on your channel and who you, who you allowed to view it were entirely up to you. Most users chose to run a voyeur channel, which was like being the star of your own 24-hour reality show. Hovering virtual cameras would follow your avatar around the oasis as you went about your day-to-day -day activities. You could limit access to your channel so that only your friends could watch, or you could change viewers by the hour to access your POV or charge viewers by the hour to access your POV. A lot of second-tier celebrities and porno pornographers did this, selling their virtual lives at a per-minute premium. Some people used their POV to broadcast live video of their real-world selves or their dog or their kids. Some people program nothing but old cartoons. The possibilities were endless and the variety of stuff available seemed to grow more twisted every day. Non-stop foot fetish videos broadcast out of Eastern Europe, amateur porn featuring deviant soccer mums in Minnesota, you name it. Every flavour of weirdness the human psyche could cook up was being filmed and broadcast online. The vast wasteland of television programming had finally reached its zenith, and the average person was no longer limited to 15 minutes of fame. Now everyone could be on TV every second of every day, whether or not anyone was watching. And here at Book Club, we have our own... Um, our own... Uh, Excuse me. Our own edition of POV, right? Lewis Kirk reading books. Parzival TV wasn't a voyeur channel. In fact, I never showed my avatar's face on my vid feed. Instead, I programmed a selection of classic 80s TV shows, retro commercials, cartoons, music, videos and movies. Lots of movies. On the weekends, I showed old Japanese monster flicks along with some vintage anime. Whatever struck my fancy, it really didn't matter what I programmed. My avatar was still one of the high five, so my vid feed drew millions of viewers every day, regardless of what I aired, and this allowed me to sell commercial time to my various sponsors. Most of Parsifal TV's regular viewers were gunters who monitored my vid feed with the hope that I'd inadvertently reveal some key piece of information about the jade key or the egg itself. I never did, of course. At the moment, Parsifal TV was wrapping up a non-stop two-day Kikeda marathon. Kikeda was a late 70s Japanese action show about a red and blue android who beat the crap out of a rubber-suited monsters in each episode. I had a weakness for vintage kaiju and tokusatsu shows like Spectre Man, The Space Giants and Supeda Man. I pulled up my programming grid and made a few changes to my evening lineup. I cleared away the episodes of Riptide and Misfits of Science I'd programmed and dropped in a few back-to-back -back flicks starring Gamera, my favourite giant flying turtle. I thought they should be real crowd pleasers. Then, to finish off the broadcast, I added a few episodes of Silver Spoons. Hello there, Lacliffia. Hi, welcome. Artemis also ran her own vid feed channel, Artem Artemivision, Artemivision, and I always kept one of my monitors tuned into it. Right now she was airing her usual Monday evening fair, an episode of Square Pegs. After that would be Electra Woman and Dinah Grail, followed by back to back episodes of Isis and Wonder Woman. Her programming lineup hadn't changed in ages, but it didn't matter. She still got killer ratings. Recently, she'd also launched her own wildly successful clothing line for full-figure female avatars under the label Artemis. She was doing really well for herself. After that night in the distracted globe, Artemis had cut off all contact with me. 
She blocked all of my emails, phone calls and chat requests. She also stopped making posts to her blog. I tried everything I could think of to reach her. I sent her avatar flowers. I made multiple trips to her avatar stronghold, an armoured palace on Benatar, the small moon she owned. I dropped mixtapes and notes on her palace from the air like lovesick bombs. Once, in a supreme act of desperation, I stood outside her palace gates for two solid hours with a boombox over my head blasting In Your Eyes by Peter Gabriel at full volume. She didn't come out. I don't even know if she was home. I'd been living in Columbus for over five months now, and it had been eight long, torturous weeks since I'd last spoken to Artemis. But I hadn't spent all that time moping around and feeling sorry myself. Well, not all of it anyway. I'd try to enjoy my new life as a world-famous sector-hopping gunter. Even though I'd maxed out my avatar's power level, I continued to complete as many quests as possible to add to my already impressive collection of weapons, magic items and vehicles, which I kept in a vault deep within my stronghold. Questing kept me busy and served as a, well, as a welcome distraction from the growing loneliness and isolation I felt. I tried to reconnect with H after Artemis had dumped me, but things weren't the same. We'd grown apart, and I knew it was my fault. Our conversations were now stilted and reserved, as if we were both afraid of revealing some key piece of information the other might be able to use. I could tell he no longer trusted me, and while I'd been off obsessing over Artemis, it seemed H had become obsessed with being the first gunter to find the Jade Key. But it had been almost half a year since we'd cleared the first gate, and the Jade Key's location still remained a mystery. I hadn't spoken to H in almost a month. My last conversation with him had devolved into a shouting match, which had ended when I reminded H that he never even would have found the copper key if I hadn't led him straight to it. He glared at me in silence for a second, then logged out of the chat room. Stubborn pride kept me from calling him back right away to apologise, and now it seemed like too much time had passed. Yeah, I was on a roll. In less than six months, I'd managed to wreck both of my closest friendships. I flipped over to H's channel, which he called the H Feed. He was currently showing a WWF match from the late 80s featuring Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant. I didn't even bother checking Daito and Shoto's channel, the Dai Show, because I knew they'd be showing some old samurai movie. That's all those guys ever aired. A few months after our confrontational first meeting in H's basement, I'd managed to form a tenuous friendship with Daito and Shoto when the three of us teamed up to complete an extended quest in Sector 22. It was my idea. I felt bad about how our first encounter had ended, and I waited for an opportunity to extend some sort of olive branch to the two samurai. It came when I discovered a hidden high-level quest called Shodai Uruturaman on the planet Toku, Tokusatsu. The creation date in the quest's colophon said it had been launched several years after Halliday's death, which meant it couldn't have been any relation to the contest. It was also a Japanese language quest created by GSS's Hokkaido division. I could have tried to complete it in my, uh, on my own using the Mandarax real-time translator software insta installed in all Oasis accounts, but it would have been risky. Mandarax had been known to garble or misinterpret quest instructions and cues, which could easily lead to fatal mistakes. Daito and Shoto lived in Japan. They'd become national heroes there, and I knew that they both spoke Japanese and English fluently. So I'd, so I'd contacted them to ask if they were interested in teaming up with me just for this one quest. They were sceptical at first, but after I described the unique nature of the quest and what I believed the payoff for solving it might be, they finally agreed. The three of us met outside the quest gate of Tokusatsu and entered it together. The quest was a recreation of all 39 episodes of the original Ultraman TV series, which had aired on Japanese television from 1966 to 1967. 
The show's storyline centred around a human named Hayata, who was a member of the Science Patrol, an organisation devoted to fighting the hordes of giant Godzilla-like monsters that were constantly attacking Earth and threatening human civilization. When the Science Patrol encountered a threat they couldn't handle on their own, Hayata would use an alien device called a Beta Capsule to transform into an alien super-being known as Ultraman. Then he would proceed to kick the monster of the week's ass, using all sorts of kung fu moves and energy attacks. If I had entered the quest gate by myself, I would have automatically played through the entire series' storyline as Hayata. But because Shoto, Daito and I had all entered at once, we were each allowed to select a different Science Patrol team member to play. We could then change or swap characters at the start of the next level or episode. The three of us took turns playing Hayata and his science patrol teammates, Hoshino and Arashi. As with most quests in the Oasis, playing as a team made it easier to defeat the various enemies and complete each of the levels. It took us an entire week, often playing over 16 hours a day, before we were finally able to clear all 39 levels and complete the quest. As we stepped out of the quest gate, our avatars were each awarded a huge amount of experience points and several thousand credits. But the real prize for completing the quest was an incredibly rare artefact, Hayata's Beta Capsule. The small metal cylinder allowed the avatar who possessed it to transform into Ultraman once a day for up to three minutes. Since there were three of us, there was a debate over who should be allowed to keep the artefact. Parsifal should have it, Shoto had said, turning to his older brother. He found this quest. We wouldn't even have known about it, were it not for him. Of course, Daito had disagreed, and he would not have been able to complete the quest without our help. He said the only fair thing to do would be to auction off the beta capsule and split the proceeds. But there was no way I could allow that. The artefact was far too valuable to sell, and I knew it would end up in the hands of the Sixers, because they purchased nearly every major artefact that went up for auction. I also saw this as an opportunity to get on Daisho's good side. You two should keep the beta capsule, I said. Orotoraman. Did I say Ultraman? Oh, it is Ultraman. Orotoraman is Japan's greatest superhero. His powers belong in Japanese hands. They were both surprised and humbled by my generosity, especially Daito. Thank you, Parsifal son, he said, bowing low. You're a man of honour. After that, the three of us had parted as friends, if not necessarily allies, and I considered that an ample reward for my effort. A chime sounded in my ears, and I checked the time. It was almost eight o'clock, time to make the doughnuts. I was always hard up for cash, no matter how frugal I tried to be. I had several large bills to pay each month, both in the real world and in the Oasis. My real world expenses were pretty standard, rent, electricity, food, water, hardware repairs and upgrades. My avatar's expenses were far more exotic, spacecraft repairs, teleportation fees, power cells, ammunition. I purchased my ammo in bulk, but it still wasn't cheap and my monthly teleportation expenses were often astronomical. My search for the egg required constant travel, and GSS kept raising their teleportation fares. I'd already spent all of my remaining product endorsement dough. Most of it went towards the cost of my rig and buying my own asteroid. I earned a decent amount of money each month by selling commercial time on my POV channel, and by auctioning off any unneeded magical items, armour or weapons I acquired during my travels. But my primary source of income was my full-time job doing Oasis technical support. When I'd created my new Bryce Lynch identity, I'd given myself a college degree, along with multiple technical certifications, and a long, sterling work record as an Oasis programmer and app developer. However, Despite my sterling, bogus resume, the only job I'd been able to get was as a Tier 1 technical support representative at Helpful Help Desk 
Incorporated, one of the contract firms GSS used to handle Oasis customer service and support. I now worked 40 hours a week, helping morons reboot their Oasis consoles and update the drivers for their haptic gloves. It was gruelling work, but it paid the rent. I logged out of my own Oasis account and then used my rig to log in to a separate Oasis account I'd been issued for work. The login process completed and I took control of a happy help desk avatar, a cookie cutter Ken doll that I used to take tech support calls. This avatar appeared inside a huge virtual call centre, inside a virtual cubicle, sitting at a virtual desk in front of a virtual computer wearing a virtual headphone set. I thought of this place as my own private virtual hell. Helpful Help Desk Inc. took millions of calls a day from all over the world, 24-7, 365, one angry, befuddled cretin after another. There was no downtime between calls because there was always several hundred morons in the call queue and all of them willing to wait on hold for hours to have a tech rep hold their hand and fix their problem. Why, bo why bother looking up the solution online? Why try to figure the problem out on your own when you could have someone else do your thinking for you? As usual, my 10-hour shift passed slowly. It was impossible for help desk avatars to leave their cubicles, but I found other ways to pass the time. My work account was rigged so that I couldn't browse outside websites, but I'd hacked my visor to allow me to listen to music or stream movies off my hard drives while I took calls. When my shift finally ended and I logged out of work, I immediately logged back into my own Oasis account. I had thousands of new email messages waiting and I could just tell by their subject lines what had happened while I had been at work. Oh, I'll read that again. When my shift finally ended and I logged out of work, I immediately logged back into my own Oasis account. I had thousands of new email messages waiting and I could tell by their subject lines what had happened while I'd been at work. Artemis had found the Jade Key. Oh, oh. <clears throat> it's heating up. Artemis has been continuing to work and, yeah, found the Jade Key, so... Oh. Some sound effects. <laughs> Some more sound effects. <laughs> After all that fun, back to the book. Chapter 21. Like other gunters around the globe, I'd been dreading the next change on the scoreboard because I knew it was going to give the Sixers an unfair advantage. A few months after we'd all cleared the first gate, an anonymous avatar had placed an ultra-powerful artefact up for auction. It was called Findoro's Tablet of Finding, and it had unique powers that could give its owner a huge advantage in the hunt for Halliday's Easter egg. <laughs> hey Julie, it sure is. <clears throat> Most of the virtual items in the Oasis were created by the system at random and they would drop when you killed an NPC or completed a quest. The rarest such items were artefacts, super powerful magic items that gave their owners incredible abilities. Only a few hundred of these artefacts existed and most of them dated back to the earliest days of the Oasis when it was still primarily an MMO game. <clears throat> Every artefact was unique, meaning that only one copy of it existed in the entire simulation. Usually the way to obtain an artefact was to defeat some godlike villain at the end of a high level quest. If you got lucky, the bad guy would drop an artefact when you killed him. You could also obtain an artefact by killing an avatar who had one in his inventory or by purchasing one in an online auction. Since artefacts were so rare, it was always big news when one went up for auction. 
Some had been known to sell for hundreds of thousands of credits, depending on their powers. The record had been set three years ago when an artefact called the Catalyst, Cataclyst sorry, was auctioned off. According to its auction listing, the Cataclyst was a sort of magical bomb and it could be used only once. When it was detonated, it would kill every single avatar and NPC in the sector, including its owner. There was no defence against it. If you are unlucky enough to be in the same sector when it went off, you are a goner, regardless of how powerful or well protected you were. The Cataclyst had sold to an anonymous bidder for just over a million credits. The artefact still hadn't been detonated, so its new owner still had it sitting around somewhere, waiting for the right time to use it. It was something of a running joke now. When a gunter was surrounded by avatars she didn't like, she would claim to have the Cataclyst in her inventory and threaten to detonate it. But most people suspected that the item had actually fallen into the Sixes' hand, along with countless other powerful artefacts. Findoro's tablet of finding wound up selling for even more than the Cataclyst, according to the auction description. The tablet, or oh sorry, full stop, according to the auction description, the tablet was a flat circle of polished black stone, and it had one very simple power. Once a day, its owner could write any avatar's name on its surface and the tablet would display that avatar's location at that exact moment. However, this power had range limitations. If you were in a different oasis sector than the avatar you were trying to find, the tablet would tell you only which sector your target was currently in. If you are already in the same sector, the tablet would tell you what planet your target was currently on or closest to if they were out in space. If you are already on the same planet as your target when you use the tablet, it would show you their exact coordinates on a map. As the artefact seller made sure to point out in his auction listing, if you use the tablet's power in conjunction with the scoreboard, it arguably became the most valuable artefact in the entire oasis. All you had to do was watch the top rankings of the scoreboard and wait until someone's score increased. The second that happened, you could write that avatar's name on the tablet and it would tell you where they were at that exact moment, thus revealing the location of the key they'd just found or the gate they'd just exited. Due to the artefact's range limitations, it might take two or three attempts to narrow down the exact location of a key or a gate, but even so, that was still information a lot of people would be willing to kill for. When Findoro's tablet of finding went up for auction, a huge bidding war broke out between several of the large Gunter clans, but when the auction finally ended, the tablet wound up selling to the Sixers for almost a million cre for almost two million credits. Sorrento himself used his own IOI account to bid on the tablet. He waited until the last few seconds of the auction and then outbid everyone. He could have bid anonymously, but he obviously wanted the world to know who now possessed the artifact. It was also his way of letting those of us in the high five know that from that moment forward, whenever one of us found a key or cleared a gate, the Sixers would be tracking us, and there would be nothing we could do about it. At first, I was worried the Sixers would also try to use the tablet to hunt down each of our avatars and kill us one at a time, but locating our avatars wouldn't do them any good unless we happened to be in a PvP zone at the time and were stupid enough to stay put until the Sixers could reach us. And since the tablet could be used only once a day, they would also run the risk of missing their window of opportunity if the scoreboard changed on the same day they tried to use the tablet to locate one of us. They didn't take the chance. They kept the artefact in reserve and waited for their moment. Less than uh, less than. A half hour after Artemis's score increased, the entire Sixer fleet was spotted converging on Sector 7. The moment the scoreboard changed, the Sixers had obviously used Findoro's tablet of finding to try to ascertain Artemis's exact location. 
Luckily, the six that Avatar used in the tablet, probably Sorrento himself, happened to be in a different sector from Artemis, so the tablet didn't reveal what planet she was on, it only told the Sixers which sector she was currently in, and so the entire Sixer fleet had immediately hightailed to Sector 7. Thanks to their complete lack of subtlety, the whole world now knew the Jade Key must be hidden somewhere in that sector. Naturally, thousands of gunters began to converge on it too. The Sixers had narrowed the search area for everyone. Luckily, Sector 7 contained hundreds of planets, moons and other worlds, and the Jade Key could have been hidden on any one of them. I spent the rest of the day in shock, revelling at the news I'd been dethroned. That was exactly how the news feed headlines put it. Passable dethroned, Artemis new number one gunter. Sixers closing in. Once I finally got a grip, I pulled up the scoreboard and made myself stare at it for 30 solid minutes while I mentally berated myself. Artemis 129,000, Parsifal 110,000, and so on and so on and so on. <clears throat> You've got no one to blame. Hello there, Adai. You've got no one to blame. You, you've got no one but yourself to blame, I told myself. You let success go to your head. You slacked off on your research. What do you think? What? Did you think lightning would strike twice? That eventually you'd just stumble across the clue you needed to find the jade key? Sitting in first place all that time gave you a full sense of security. But you don't have that problem now, do you, arsehead? No, because instead of buckling down and focusing on your quest like you should have done, you pissed away your lead. You wasted almost half a year screwing around and pining over some girl you've never even met in person. The girl who dumped you. The same girl who is going to end up beating you. Now, get your head back in the game, moron. Find that key. Suddenly, I wanted to win the contest more than ever. Not just for the money, I wanted to prove myself to Artemis. And I wanted the hunt to be over so that she would talk to me again so that I could finally meet her in person, see her true face, and try to make sense of how I felt about her. I cleared the scoreboard off my display and opened up my grail diary, which had now grown into a vast mountain of data, containing every scrap of information I'd collected since the contest began. It appeared as a jumble of cascading windows floating in front of me, displaying text, maps, photos, and audio and audio, audio and video files, audio and video files, all indexed, cross-referenced, and pulsing with life. <laughs> I've already read the BFG, so I'm afraid uh, maybe one day, if, if lots of people want to hear it, I'll read the BFG again, but you can watch the replay. So just type live reading, or I think it's BFG, the BFG live audio book. So you can find it on the channel. <clears throat> I kept the quatrain open in a window that was always on top. Four lines of text, 24 words, 34 syllables. I'd stared at them so often and for so long that they'd nearly lost all meaning. Looking at them again now, I had to resist the urge to scream in rage and frustration. The captain conceals the jade key in a dwelling long neglected, but you can only blow the whistle once the trophies are all collected. I knew the answer was right there in front of me. Artemis had already figured it out. I read over my notes about John Draper, a.k.a. Captain Crunch, and the toy plastic whistle that had made him famous in the annals of hacker lore. I still believe that these were the captain and whistle Halliday was referring to, but the rest of the quatrain's meaning remained a mystery. 
But now I possessed a new piece of information. The key was somewhere in Sector 7. So I pulled up my Oasis Atlas and began to search for planets with names I thought might somehow be related to the Quatrain. I found a few worlds named after famous hackers like Woz and Mitnick, but none named after John Draper. Sector 7 also contained hundreds of worlds named after old Usenet newsgroups, <clears throat> and on one of these, the planet Alt Freaking, there was a statue of Draper posing with an ancient rotary phone in one hand and a Captain Crunch whistle in the other. But the statue had been erected three years after Halliday's death, so I knew it was a dead end. I read through the quatrain yet again, and this time the last two lines jumped out at me. But you can only blow the whistle once the trophies are all collected. Trophies. Somewhere in Sector 7. I needed to find a collection of trophies in Sector 7. I did a quick search of my files on Halliday. From what I could tell, the only trophies he'd ever owned were the five Game Designer of the Year awards he'd won back at around the turn of the century. These trophies were still on display in the GSS Museum in Columbus, but there were replicas of them on display inside the Oasis on a planet called Arcade, or Arcade. Hey Keith, you're very welcome, my friend. I'm glad you uh, I'm glad you enjoy that. Um, I'm glad you enjoyed the readings to wind down after work. Uh, a day, yes. If you go on the channel, you'll see a playlist thing. If you go out of this video, go onto the channel, subscribe, go to um, playlists. There's a roll doll playlist. You'll find all your favourite Roald Dahls in that playlist, my friend. So have a good time. Knock yourself out. <clears throat> These trophies were still on display in the GSS Museum in Columbus, but there were replicas of them on display inside the Oasis on a planet called Arcade. Ar and Arcade was located in Sector 7. The connection seemed thin, but I still wanted to check it out. At the very least, it would make me feel like I was doing something productive for the next few hours. I glanced over at Max, who was currently doing the Samba on one of my command centre monsters. Max, prep the Vonnegut for takeoff, if you're not too busy. Max stopped dancing and smirked at me. You got it, El Comanchero? I got up and walked over to my Stronghold's elevator, which I'd modelled after the turbo lift of the original Star Trek series. I rode down four levels to my armoury, a massive vault filled with storage shelves, display cases and weapon racks. I pulled up my avatar's inventory display, which appeared as a classic paper doll diagram of my avatar, onto which I could drag and drop various items and pieces of equipment. Arcade was located in a PvP zone, so I decided to upgrade my gear and wear my Sunday best. I put on my gleaming plus ten hail mail powered armour, then strapped on my favourite set of blaster pistols and slung a pump action pistol grip shotgun across my back, along with a plus five Vorpal bastard sword. I also grabbed a few other essential items, an extra pair of anti-grav boots, a ring of magic resistance, an amulet of protection, some gauntlets of giant strength. I hated the idea of needing something and not having it with me, so I usually ended up carrying enough equipment for three gunters. When I ran out of room on my avatar's body, I stored the additional gear in my backpack of holding. Once I was properly outfitted, I hopped back onto the elevator, and a few seconds later I arrived at the entrance of my hangar, located on the bottom level of my stronghold. Pulsing blue lights lined the runway which ran up the centre of the hangar to a massive pair of armoured doors at the far end. These doors opened into the launch tunnel, which led up to a matching set of armoured doors set into the asteroid surface. Standing on the left side of the runway was my battle-worn X-Wing fighter. Parked on the right side was my DeLorean. Sitting on the runway itself was my most frequently used spacecraft, the Vonnegut.
Max had already powered up the engines and they emitted a low, steady roar that filled the hangar. My Vonnegut was a heavily modified Firefly class transport vessel modelled after the Serenity in the classic Firefly TV series. The ship had been named the K. Lee when I'd first obtained it, but I'd immediately rechristened it after one of my favourite 20th century novelists. Its, n its new name was stenciled on the side of its battered grey hull. <clears throat> I'd looted the Vonnegut from a cadre of oviraptor clansmen who had foolishly attempted to hijack my X-Wing while I was cruising through a large group of worlds in Sector 11 known as the Wedonverse. The oviraptors were cocky bastards with no clue who they were messing with. I was in a foul mood even before they'd opened fire on me. Otherwise, I'd probably just have evaded them by jumping to light speed, but that day I decided to take their attack personally. Ships were like most other items in the Oasis. Each one had specific attributes, weapons and speed capabilities. My X-Wing was far more manoeuvrable than the Oviraptor's large transport ship, so it was no trouble for me to avoid the barrage from their aftermarket guns while I bombarded them with laser bolts and proton torpedoes. After I disabled their engines, I boarded the ship and proceeded to kill every avatar there. The captain tried to apologise when he saw who I was, but I wasn't in a forgiving mood. After I dispatched the crew, I parked my X-Wing in the cargo hold and then cruised home in my new ship. As I approached the Vonnegut, the loading ramp extended to the, lang to the hangar floor. By the time I reached the cockpit, the ship was already lifting off. I heard the landing gear retract with a thud just as I seated myself at the controls. Max, lock up the house and set a course for Arcade. Aye, aye, c -c Captain, Max stuttered from the, one of the cockpit monitors. The hangar door slid open and the Vonnegut rocketed out a launch tunnel and up into the starry sky. As the ship cleared the surface, the armoured tunnel doors slammed closed behind it. I spotted several ships camped out in a high orbit above Falco, the usual suspects, crazed fans, wannabe disciples and aspiring bounty hunters. A few of them, the ones currently turning to follow me, were tagalongs, people who spent most of their time trying to, trying to tail prominent gunters and gather intel on their movements so they could sell the information later. I was always able to lose these idiots by jumping to light speed. A lucky thing for them. If I couldn't lose someone who was trying to tail me, I usually had no choice but to stop and kill them. As the Vonnegut made the jump to light speed, each of the planets on my view screen became a long streak of light. L the light speed engaged, Captain, Max reported. ETA to Arcade is an estimated 53 minutes, 15 if you want to use the nearest Stargate. Stargates were strategically located throughout each sector. They were really just giant spaceship-sized teleporters, but since they charged by the mass of your ship and the distance you wanted to travel, they were normally used only by corporations or extremely wealthy avatars with credits to burn. I was neither, but under the circumstances, I was willing to splurge a little. Let's take the Stargate, Max. We're in kind of a hurry. Right, I think um, we're going to leave it there for the night, guys. And then um, tomorrow it looks like Parsifal is going to find the Jade Key. And then he'll be looking for the second gate, right? So, yeah. That's all for this evening. Sorry to end it abruptly there, but yeah, I'm getting quite tired. And, and like I say, we've still got a fair bit of reading to go. So um, I'll be back tomorrow <laughs> for another good session. 
and um, yeah, we'll continue. And I really, well, I, I want to read something different on um, Sunday. I'm going to put out a poll tomorrow, what we should read next. And so I must uh, read, finish this book by um, Thursday night. So we've got two more sessions tomorrow and then Thursday. I'm just going to have to go power through to the end. So Thursday could be a, a long one. So be sure to join me on Thursday. Uh, Julie Whitelaw, you are so welcome. And thanks for being a dedicated, um, I don't know, I don't know what you are, but a dedicated um book lover it, it, it's amazing that you you've been here and and it's been nice to see a familiar face so thank you for being here i'll be back tomorrow with part four and then thursday night we will 100 percent finish the book because i want to get it finished so we can read something different on sunday and i'll drop that poll tomorrow so keep your eye out for that be sure to vote tell a friend and i'll see you soon take care guys I'll see you tomorrow. Bye now.